So we are thrilled to kick off the research forum tonight with OVCAN, continuing to drive research progress in Canada. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Alicia Tohn, OVCAN project manager and scientific advisor with Ovarian Cancer Canada, and she is joined by Dr. Barb Vanderheiden, member of Ovarian Cancer Canada Board of Directors and chair of the research committee. Dr. Vanderheiden also chairs the OVCAN Governing Council. Welcome Dr. Tone and Dr. Vanderheiden, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it is my great pleasure and Alicia's, I'm sure too, um, for us to have this opportunity to describe some of the research that has been um, made with OVCAN over the last four years. It's hard to believe that we are more than four years in and that OVCAN is scheduled to, um, to finish next um, March. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so OFCAN did begin with a $10 million allocation from the federal government in 2019, and we have been very fortunate to have partnerships that have brought that amount almost to $14 million. There were three priorities that we had set, um, how we were going to spend that money and hopefully to have the most impact on, on patient care. And the, those three priorities include uh, development of research models, then the use of those research models to test novel treatments, and then ideally moving the most promising novel treatments into personalized clinical trials. Um, I'm very pleased to say that we have funded 44 projects altogether uh, with the funding that, that OCC has garnered over the last few years. Um, and that includes 25 research models, 13 preclinical studies, and six clinical trials. I think one of the most interesting things about OVCAN, the greatest achievement, let's say, um, is that it took a, a fledgling ovarian cancer research community and brought it to full speed together to work collectively and collaboratively, and uh, as well as bringing on 20 patient partners who are actively engaged uh, at every step of the way, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that later. Next slide. So the 250 researchers really are from coast to coast. I was marveling at the location of all the individuals who were saying they're here from here, uh, from there. Um, and you can see that the researchers are really indeed from coast to coast, from Brad Nelson out in Victoria, BC, to Jeanette Boudreau in, in Halifax. And so wherever you have come from, hopefully you can find the faces there of some of the researchers that are involved um, in ovarian cancer research and part of OFCAN funded projects. Um, it really has been the most dynamic opportunity that we've ever had to all work together to achieve some common goals. Next slide. So we have invested in all types of ovarian cancer. We put a high priority on ensuring that there would be attention given not only to the most common, uh, which is high grade serous ovarian cancer, but also to take the opportunity to build model systems, to develop new treatment ideas, and to even bring on clinical trials that would be open to individuals with other uh, types of ovarian cancer. And so you can see clear cell and endometrioid, low-grade serous, mucinous. And I think most importantly, there's one there, the small cell carcinoma of the ovary that has rarely been studied um, until very recently. Now we've got projects going that are studying that rarest of ovarian cancer. Next slide. So I'll, I'll talk about priority one first. We just have one slide to describe everything that's been done. And I can tell you that it has been um, uh, a boondoggle, let's say, with in terms of all the things that have been done. And now the opportunities are to, to build uh, new treatments based on those models. We have no less than 338 new models that have been developed for ovarian cancer. Um, and they include all different kinds of models of all different kinds of ovarian subtypes. And we've pulled out one of the more promising ones that you'll get to hear about a little later on from Dr. Jeanette Boudreau, um, one of our newest investigators. And, and she really has a cool model that I'm hoping you're going to enjoy hearing about. We also have put a lot of investment into profiling the DNA, RNA, and protein of, of those tumors, as well as the immune cells. How are the immune cells um, talking to each other within those tumors? And that is telling us a lot about how did these cancers begin? How did they form? 
And more importantly, why are they resistant to some treatment? Why won't they be uh, killed when a treatment is given? And you're gonna hear one of those stories in much greater detail from Dr. Mark Carey later on, who's going to um, try to give us a better understanding of what determines the response to targeted treatment in a rare type of ovarian cancer. Uh, his specialty is low-grade serous cancer. And in priority two, we have 13 projects altogether that were funded. Um, this is a very exciting area because this is where all the newest discoveries that had yet to have the opportunity to be tested fully um, are taking advantage of all those new models. And we're seeing if any of these novel treatments might work. Um, so we have one project completed, um, lots of very exciting results coming from that one. 12 are in progress. And one of them has been funding, has funded uh, Dr. Marilyn Labrie, who you'll hear about later on as well, or later on, she'll uh, give a summary of that. She's a new investigator. So we're constantly trying to bring new scientists into the fold. Some of those treatments that are being tested are immune-based or immunotherapies. Um, several are targeted inhibitors. So PARPIC uh, uh, inhibitors are an example, like Olaparib are an example of a targeted inhibitor. We've got five more that are being tested and then three novel gene targets that have never been studied before in the context of ovarian cancer. Alicia? Thanks, Barb. So as mentioned, we've actually funded six clinical trials testing new treatment approaches for ovarian cancer. Three of these trials are currently recruiting patients and a combined 61 patients have been involved, enrolled, sorry, in OFCAN funded trials as of April, 2023. So I'm going to provide a few key details on those trials that are open um, and links to more information for each of these will be added to the chat for anyone who's interested in learning more. So the first trial nicknamed ES2 focuses on testing the combination of the PARP inhibitor Olaparib and another drug that promotes tumor cell death. This trial is led by Dr. Diane Provencher from the CHUM in Montreal and Dr. Helen McKay from Sunnybrook in Toronto. The very first of 30 patients has been enrolled and now there are three active study sites uh, in Quebec and Ontario. The study population includes women with recurrent metastatic high-grade serous cancer who recur greater than six months after platinum-based chemotherapy. The second open trial is looking at the impact of a novel inhibitor named CX5461 um, in patients with mutations in BRCA1 and 2, PELB2, or other homologous recombination genes. This study is led by Dr. Amit Oza at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto, but is also active at the CHUM in Montreal, um, and 13 patients have been enrolled to date. The third open trial, nicknamed REVOLVE, is using real-time assessment of gene changes in tumor samples to determine the best next course of treatment after progressing on a PARP inhibitor. This trial is led by Dr. Stephanie LaRue at Princess Margaret in Toronto. And for now, this is the only site given, uh, as you can imagine, the complex logistics of running a trial like this. Three patients have been recruited so far and patients must be diagnosed with recurrent high-grade serous or high-grade high endometrioid to be eligible. So before I move on, it's important to note that all of these clinical trials have embedded patient partners who are providing feedback to the study teams on patient-facing material, recruitment plans, and study design. So speaking of patient partners, a crucial component to the success of OVCAN is our National Patient Partners and Research Program. This program was developed by Ovarian Cancer Canada to keep the voices of those with lived experience at the forefront of research. Our PPIR team, some of whom are, are pictured here, includes a diverse representation of ovarian cancer types, age, sexuality, cultural backgrounds, and geography, with each member bringing their unique perspective and shared experiences. We currently have 18 members, including two patient co-leads, one of whom will be co-moderating a session with me tonight, with six team members being featured uh, at this research forum. We're also looking to expand our team. So these details will be provided later in tonight's program for anyone 
um, who is interested in, in this kind of thing. Finally, our team of patient partners has been very busy over the past several months with, these are just a few examples shown here. So two of our patient partners, Starlet Fiddler and Donna Pepin were featured in a special series of episodes by the GOSH podcast uh, produced by the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative in BC. And these podcasts can be found on the Ovarian Cancer Canada website. Two patient, um, sorry, OCC run bridging the gap sessions here are also underway. So these sessions are informal get to know you meetings for research trainees or early investigators, as well as patient partners. And this really builds relationships and fosters future collaborations. Starla Fiddler pictured here also participated in provincial research advocacy in Saskatchewan. And our patient partner from Manitoba, Sylvia, um, very small picture here, uh, co-presented with Ovarian Cancer Canada's research coordinator, Dr. Jessica Lawson at the Manitoba Ovarian Cancer Research Symposium. Next, one of our patient partners, Julie Pauling, who you'll also hear from tonight, recently spoke to 160 high school students at the Let's Talk Cancer event in Ottawa, which you'll hear more about later. And finally, scientific and patient leads of PPIR were invited to participate in a think tank on patient engagement in Atlantic Canada in May. And this really highlights our growing reputation as leaders in this field. So back to Barb. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I hope that you are getting as excited as I was at the very beginning of AFCAN and being able to see the tremendous progress that has been made. We've been very focused and we couldn't have done it without patients um, guiding us every step of the way. But we have to think of what comes next and what comes next is what we've called beyond AFCAN. So it is a vision to contain, to maintain, to sustain the research program that has been um, developed by Ovarian Cancer Canada in AFCAN to ensure that we continue that work um, uh, for another five years at least from 2024 to 2029. The goal is to continue to have innovative, high quality, made in Canada scientific research, um, but to extend it beyond treatment, which is where our focus is right uh, in OFCAN, to include prevention, diagnosis, and survivorship as well. So broaden the mandate considerably. We also want to maintain some of the things that made us special in the research community in Canada, um, that is making us collaborative more than competitive and, and allowing us to develop a national scientific toolbox, but add in other elements that have started with OFCAN. I think we can make them even more, uh, give them greater strength, let's say, and beyond OFCAN. And particularly the power of the patient voice always has to be there and including more uh, attention to the social determinants of health. Overall, the goals of beyond OFCAN, OFCAN would be to take the, what we have developed so far, and use that as planting the seeds of progress for future uh, development in all areas of research beyond treatment. So that includes uh, decreasing the incidence by prevention, decreasing the incidence of late diagnosis, which is one of the most challenging features that we have for this disease, increasing equity in care and research, and increase, increasing the quality of life for women who are affected by this disease. I do need to say thank you. Uh, it, we couldn't have done this without the initial investment from federal government, but also all the other partners that have stepped up to recognize that this gave us the opportunity to expand the amount of research that could be done in a very focused way. Um, all our partners and particularly the patients who've helped to guide the research right from the beginning, who've helped us decide which projects get funded and which do not, um, they play such an important role in OFCAN and I hope to see that continue for at least another five years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Barb and Alicia. Um, Barb, you said a few things there I loved. I loved hearing the collaboration and the teamwork and the patient focus. There are definitely exciting things ahead. Um, as always, it's a pleasure to hear both of you speak. Uh, your passion and excitement for your work shines through always. So thank you both. At Ovarian Cancer Canada, as mentioned uh, just now by Barb and Alicia, we put the patient at the forefront of everything we do. Patient 
scientists are embedded in all aspects of our research, such as serving on grant review panels, consulting on funding proposals and patient resources, and becoming active members of research teams. Tonight, we are introducing you to a handful of these incredible women who are involved with the Patient Partners in Research program and will share with us their motivations for getting involved, also some of their experiences that they've had to date as a patient partner. I'd like to introduce you now uh, to Dr. Jessica Lawson, who is Ovarian Cancer Canada's Research Coordinator, who will introduce you to our panel of patient partners in research this evening. Over to you, Jessica. Great, thank you so much, Steph, and thank you for the introduction. So as Steph mentioned, I'm the Research Coordinator here at Ovarian Cancer Canada. I have 14 years of educational training in cell biology and genetics, and I've been in the cancer research field since 2013. In 2016, I switched my focus to ovarian cancer when I started my PhD, and my research project aimed to understand the genetics of a rare type of ovarian cancer called adult type granulosa cell tumors, and to develop new research models to study the biology of these cancers. After my PhD training, I took a quick break when I had my daughter, and my family and I actually moved across the country. We now live in Montreal. Uh, last summer we did, and then I started working with Ovarian Cancer Canada in August of 2022. So in my role, I co-lead the patient partners and research team uh, with our scientific advisor, Dr. Alicia Tone, and our two patient partners, uh, Donna Pepin and Shannon Kadar. So you'll hear from Donna and Alicia, who are moderating the training session later tonight, so stay tuned for that as well. And as Alicia mentioned, the Patient Partners in Research program was developed by Ovarian Cancer Canada to keep the voices of those with lived experience uh, at the forefront of research. And engaging ovarian cancer patients as partners in research really reflects our philosophy that scientific as well as clinical inquiry can be modified and enhanced by, by valuing the input and viewpoints of those affected by this disease. And this type of patient-centered research prioritizes research questions that patients and their loved ones deem relevant and meaningful. So today we'll be talking to three members of our patient partners and research team, but we want you to know that our team has really grown to include 18 members from all across Canada. We have individuals from British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. So I'll first give each panelist uh, the opportunity to introduce themselves, including a bit about their story and what motivated them to get involved with our patient partners and research program. So first up, we have Julie Pauling, who's joining us from Ottawa. Ontario, Julie. Hi, good evening. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Pauling, and I've been a patient partner since the program first began. I became involved with Ovarian Cancer Canada when I was diagnosed with stage four high-grade serous ovarian cancer in 2011. And um, at the time, a colleague of mine created a Walk of Hope team in my name. Like many, uh, although my first several months of living with ovarian cancer were spent in a haze of shock and medical activity, I knew going in that ovarian cancer was not a form of cancer that women lived with for long. And thus, uh, Ovarian Cancer Canada's advocacy role became a very important source of engagement for me, as well as for both hope and power. The first walk of hope I was in was championed by Canadian figure skater Elizabeth Manley. And uh, it was important. I was met there by members of my family who had come from all across the family to support me in the walk, but also by members of my medical team and um, strangers who had read my blog and simply wanted to come and be there. And then in 2011, Ovarian Cancer Canada just happened to be ramping up its efforts to prioritize research into finding new outcomes and clinical options for this most fatal of gynecological cancers and good timing, I was very pleased to be included. I appeared on local TV news outlets a couple of times. I was present at the Lobby Day on Parliament Hill in 2017, at which OCC was successful in its appeal to the federal government to allocate the $10 million specifically to ovarian cancer research in the next federal budget. And ultimately, I became involved in many other amazing opportunities of which you will hear more about in this session. So thank you so much for inviting me here this evening. I am thrilled to be part of this tremendous celebration of our work here tonight. Thank you, Julie. I'm so happy to hear that you had such an amazing support system and that it really motivated you to connect with Ovarian Cancer Canada and be involved in all our advocacy efforts. Uh, next up, we have Martha Hoyt, who's joining us from Toronto, Ontario. 
Good evening. Thank you, Jessica. I was initially diagnosed in 1991 with a rare type of ovarian cancer, granulosis cell tumor. Very little information was available. Truthfully, there was little information about ovarian cancer in general. My surgery, discovered during infertility testing, was conservative, a right oophorectomy respecting my wish to have more children. Our son is now 31 years old. Raising a family, working full-time, tending to a busy household, life returned to normal. Our world changed when this indolent cancer returned in 1996, almost five years to the date of my original diagnosis. I had a full hysterectomy, five weeks of daily radiation, and a year-long recuperation. My oncologist was realistic, and I knew that I was dealing with a far more invasive disease. Well aware of the statistics, I grieved for what I might miss. This is when I became involved in what was then a nascent family foundation established by a politician in honor of his late wife. The greater my involvement, the more I realized how very few advancements had been made in the past 50 years. Cut, radiate, and poison, the standard practice of care. Silence was not an option and the situation was dire. Women were being misdiagnosed and or diagnosed at late stages. Family doctors, often the first line to diagnose, were struggling to get speedy access to imaging. And there were a number of gynecologists who were considering leaving the province to practice elsewhere. As my energy returned, so did my anger at the lack of progress. I channeled my passion into changing the dial on this disease. From this small but mighty group evolved in what, into what is now Ovarian Cancer Canada. I'm proud of the roles I've played as an advocate, a peer supporter, a speaker, fundraiser, and vice chair. Several surgeries, four recurrences, and 32 years later, I'm humbled to see how my colleagues are changing the landscape of ovarian cancer. They are my inspiration, each of whom gives 100%, many undergoing treatment. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're only a smattering of the 3,000 plus women from C to C to C who are so grateful for what is happening now. You will hear more about this progress today. Thank you for sharing your journey, Martha. It's so incredible to hear that you were involved since the very beginning and to be able to see how far we've come as an organization. And it just must be amazing. So it's really it cool. So next up, we have Livia UJ, who's joining us from Windsor, Ontario. Livia? Oh, hi, Jessica. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, my name is uh, Olivia UJ, and I've been a registered nurse uh, for over 20 years. I have experience in the hospital, um, the insurance side, and also the administrative side. My personal integrity has always been uh, centered on caring and advocating for the health and well-being of others. But after being diagnosed with stage 3A high-grade serous carcinoma in November 2020, my life completely just flipped right upside down. I was just thrusted into being on the opposite side of healthcare, and I really felt so alone. And it took browsing online and actually coming across Ovarian Cancer Canada to find hope. And I watched a symposium. Um, that was very similar to the one that we're at this evening. And I heard from other patient partners in research members, and they were sharing their personal journeys. And all of a sudden, it was like this amazing relief. I am not alone. I felt so moved to get involved. So now as a second year patient partner myself, my desire really unites with all of my Teal sisters that are out there. Um, we're the voices that empower research and we are demanding change. So I'm currently two years out from chemo with no evidence of disease per my last CT, but I continue to live with severe sensory neuropathy and it has, uh, it's really impaired my life. Um, my tumor came out of nowhere. I only had two evenings of pain when I was just rolling over in bed at night. So I went to go see my family doctor who said, oh, why don't you go to the emergency room, get an urgent CAT scan. And there you go. That showed a 15 centimeter tumor coming off of my right ovary. So surgery was done immediately that evening. 
And I was really lucky I had pain because my tumor was actually just rupturing into pieces. Uh, if that pain would not have been there, I would not have survived into the following week and I would not be with you here tonight. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for sharing your story, Livia. We're so happy that you're here with us today and we're so, so lucky to have someone with such unique experience with the medical system as one of our patient partners in research. So we'll start with our questions. My first question is directed to Julie. As you mentioned, you were involved in Ovarian Cancer Canada's advocacy campaign that secured the $10 million investment from Health Canada in 2019. You also recently consulted as a patient partner on our strategic science fund application that was submitted to the federal government in September, 2022. What excites you the most about what Ovarian Cancer Canada's uh, present and future research, about Ovarian Cancer Canada's present and future research directions? I feel very strongly about this. Um, what excites me most is that it feels like I am helping to write a long endured asymmetry in the efforts to identify, treat and manage ovarian cancer against other forms of cancer. And at a high level, it seems to me that sufferers of ovarian cancer were mostly left in silence and often briefly as they lived typically only in measures of months after initial diagnosis rather than years. And in my experience, doctors had been willing to talk about breast and other cancers uh, when it came to hereditary forms, but they kind of left that 50-50 chance of developing ovarian cancer mostly off the table. It was just too dire. Um, so, you know, fa flash forward, we're seeing that it's not just elderly women who are affected by this disease very late in life, it's young women in the prime of life who are also being struck down by various forms of ovarian cancer, often going undetected until it is too late. So in 2017, when I was part of this lobby day on Parliament Hill, the time was well past due to address inequity in scientific research funding to access to treatment and clinical trials across the country. And I am proof positive, as are many of the women in our network that you're meeting here tonight, that you can live a long and meaningful life after a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Survival cannot just be an accident of living close to well-supplied urban centers and having the luck of knowing someone at the right time, as I did to kind of get in and get things imaged in the right way. Survival of ovarian cancer has to be just as much a research concern as any other form and not denied due to logistical difficulties or a lack of knowledge. So for me, this is an act of social justice as well as being a partnership with researchers in changing the outcomes and survival survivorship. And we have the means to do better. And I think Canada can and absolutely should be at the forefront of making it so. Thank you, Julie. And thank you for bringing up some of those points. We're very lucky to have you as a patient partner and advocate. So thank you for all the work you've done with us. Martha, one of Ovarian Cancer Canada's top priorities is to fund research into all types of ovarian cancer, including the less common types. Um, as only a few women with these rare types will be seen at a single Canadian cancer center every year, national resources, including tissue banks of patient specimens are needed to propel scientific discoveries forward. So Ovarian Cancer Canada funds seven biobanks in six provinces and more than $2 million of $2 million of OPCAM funds have been directed to projects relating to rare types of ovarian cancer. As someone living with a rare type of ovarian cancer, can you tell us what it means to you to know that research into your disease is a priority? Yes, in one word, elated. Rare types of ovarian cancers are often described as orphan cancers. And it's not only the lack of funding and research, it's the sparse number of women who are able and well enough to advocate for the limited research dollars. When I was diagnosed in 91, I wasn't offered genetic testing. No labs were conducting bench research and my treatment options were the same as those offered to women diagnosed with epithelial ovarian cancer. That's all changing. We now know that endocrine therapy has shown to help stabilize or even decrease tumor size in certain rare forms of cancer. Targeted radiation may slow tumor growth, and there are more chemo options and combinations, but much more needs to be done. We need additional clinical trials in all types of ovarian cancer, and we need to continue work in high-grade serous ovarian cancer to optimize the use of PARP inhibitors and personalized treatment options. 
We need to engage a more diverse population of patients and to address regional and systemic gaps in care. And we need to remove barriers to timely genetic testing of unaffected relatives of ovarian cancer patients. And finally, we need to incorporate the patient voice in as many steps as possible. I don't dwell on the what ifs, Jessica, and I consider myself fortunate. I live in a met major metropolitan city with access to the most highly qualified medical practitioners. I have a dedicated family doctor, and I have access to psychosocial support in addition to a network of family and friends. Of course, I'm greedy. I want more time, and I want the same for all women facing this diagnosis. Thank you, Martha. As someone who studied a rare ovarian cancer, it's, it's incredible to see how far we've come and the national attention and collaboration to improve the options and outcomes for these patients that's happening now. But you're right, more needs to be done and Ovarian Cancer Canada is committed to keep this momentum going. Uh, Livia, so you participated in Ovarian Cancer Canada's uh, focus groups to guide strategic directions and you were instrumental in developing our patient partners in research program guidelines, so thank you. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about these experiences? Sure. These were amazing experiences, Jessica. Um, the focus group, you know what? It really provided us with an opportunity to meet administrators that were affiliated with Ovarian Cancer Canada's program and strategic initiatives. So our lived experiences and all of those emotional journeys, they're not just ours. They're literally carried by Ovarian Cancer Canada, and they're integrated into every single step, every, every single decision, you know, every single dollar that is spent. The focus group really, really listened to us, and they let us know that without us, there is no organization. So our feedback was heard by the board of directors, and it really drives those strategic plans that we're fighting for today. And you mentioned our, um, our patient partners and research program guideline. Uh, I have that right, ready right here. <laughs> so I just wanted to hold that up. We are so proud of this. And this is our lovely co-lead Shannon, who's on the cover very proudly. Um, so I just wanted to talk a, talk a little bit about this. Um, so our responsibility was really to review a lot of the program guidelines, um, some of the patient, uh, the partner agreements that we had in there, and there was like an information sheet. Um, so the guide represents, as we've mentioned, it's our journey as a patient partner, and it keeps the voices of those with lived experience at the forefront of research. It covers the expectations of the program. Um, it goes through like boarding processes, training, um, the framework uh, to patient engagement and research, partnerships, and even talks about like clinical trial research teams. Um, I had the privilege of and, and really honor of working with one of our one of our team members, uh, Linda Brown. She's another Teal sister and a patient partner. Uh, so it was just the two of us, and Linda had like spot on the right idea. Uh, it was a perfect opportunity for us to kind of get to know one another and really enjoy and embrace this process together. So we took on the challenge of working in different time zones around doctor's appointments. And some days really depended on how we were feeling that day. So besides the hard work that we had on editing, formatting, and, and we, had, we had our comments and computer issues, uh, we had endless laughs throughout the entire process. And she was the one that actually inspired me to even chop my own hair one evening after we got off on a video chat. We had a really, really great time. And I look forward to all the other opportunities that we have together. That's so great to hear. And I'm so grateful for you and Linda for all your help. I'm just, I'm so proud of our patient partner and research guide that we created together. And also, Olivia, your hair looks amazing short, so it was a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Julie, so you um, have been involved as a patient partner on a national research project that's exploring the impacts of hereditary cancer syndromes with regards to a, to a patient care's experience, finances, emotions, and lifestyle. Can you tell us a little bit more about this project and what role have you played in the direction of the research? Sure, I'd be happy to. So in April 2021, I was contacted by Dr. Yvonne Bombard to write a letter of support for a team grant on the direct, rather indirect, socioeconomic burden of inherited diseases. It was titled Variations in Care for Hereditary Cancer Syndrome Families, Both Direct and Indirect Socioeconomic Impacts. And so I was invited to collaborate on the grant application, but further than to also be um, a patient advisor on the project as it went forward. So I agreed quite happily and so with a, along with five other patients, I'm now co-author on all of the associated publications with this research study as well as poster presentations at conferences. And today there have been nine around the world, eight in North America, one in South Africa, and one peer-reviewed abstract published so far. So the, this is a team study that recognizes that hereditary cancer syndromes are one of the most common forms of inherited disease, with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, as well as Lynch syndrome, being the most prevalent. And these patients are more genetically susceptible to developing cancer in their own lifetime and often they require consistent lifelong screening and monitoring as well as in cases like mine treatments now and again. So the study examines how various facets of the patient's lives may be affected by the diagnosis which will include quite broadly the psychosocial, the financial and lifestyle decisions that these patients and their families would make over a lifetime as a result of having to always think about cancer risks. So personally, I contributed a letter of support to the Canadian Institute for Health Research, and I've provided commentary and suggestions on everything from the uh, research instruments, such as the interview script, on the analysis of the results, and on drafts of various publications and poster presentations. I bring to bear not only my experience as a patient, but also my professional experience has come in handy as well. And to date, within this particular study, 72 patients across BC, Ontario, Newfoundland have been interviewed and those nine conference presentations have been made. So next steps involve final data analysis and I will get to be part of that process as well. Wow, Julie, that sounds like such an incredible project and that you've been involved since the inception of the project. That is just, that's really awesome. It's, it's patient engagement at its finest. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading more publications that come from this work. So really exciting. Martha, so you had the unique opportunity to participate as a patient partner on a grant review panel that evaluated ap applications focused on testing novel treatments in preclinical studies. For this grant competition, there was a specific call for treatments that could benefit women with rare types of ovarian cancer. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience as a full voting member on this grant panel and what was it like to be at the decision table? Thank you, Jessica. Admittedly, I was apprehensive. Grade 12 biology is the extent of my medical background, and these were some of Canada's leading researchers. I was intimidated, although I had no reason to be. My late great colleague, Colleen from Saskatchewan and I were given five applications to evaluate. Each application was approximately 100 pages, dense technical reading. Prior to our meeting in October 2020, we were invited to a briefing session that was particularly helpful and included tips on how to navigate the abstracts, where to concentrate our reading and how to evaluate and grade each abstract. Over $2 million was to be awarded among the top projects. Colleen presented first at 6 a.m. Saskatchewan time. She was self-confident and exceedingly well-prepared with her take-no-prisoners approach. Her attitude contributed to my self-confidence. As patient partners, we were provided with the same evaluation forms as the scientific reviewers. And what were we looking for? High commercial and scientific merit. Was the proposal worthwhile or different from other projects from a survivor perspective? What were the benefits? Will this novel treatment have a broad impact across all types of ovarian cancer, or is the proposal targeting a subpopulation? Are there potential side effects, and if so, what's the quality of life affected? 
Is there a probability of a cure or a prolonged length of disease-free remission? Is it national in scope? Is this a first-line therapy? Each presentation consisted of two scientific reviewers and a patient partner, where we evaluated, reviewed, and assessed, followed by a group discussion, after which a ranking score was assigned to each presentation. We were given the opportunity to, prevent our, to present our scores and to defend and state why we scored the way we did. I think for me, my greatest achievement while sitting on the review panel was humanizing the research from the patient perspective. In other words, sharing my story and my lived experiences with the scientific team and drawing on my personal experiences to provide insight for these research projects. Thank you, Martha. And Colleen seems like she was such an incredible person. And I know she's greatly missed by our entire team. As you mentioned as well, I think it's extremely important to have patient partners share their lived experience with these researchers when developing the grant proposals at that stage um, to really humanize the research from the patient perspective. And I, I do believe it really does enhance the quality of research as well. So Livia, you had the unique opportunity to be interviewed by a biopharmaceutical company to discuss what it is living, what it is like living with ovarian cancer. And this included how the disease impacts your everyday life and your personal message of what you want people to know about the disease. And this video was shared with their staff. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with collaborating with this company and, and what was your personal message that you shared with them? Sure, Jessica. So again, another fantastic experience. Uh, uh, just a little bit about how the, the opportunity even occurred. Um, it came about because this biopharmaceutical company, they were interested in spotlighting a patient experience with staff, and they reached out to Ovarian Cancer Canada. And it's actually the patient partner and research program. They helped to facilitate these requests. So that's where I was honored to share my experience and my perspective uh, with that company. Um, so what transpired an engagement manager, um, she contacted me and we had a wonderful relationship. Uh, and I would say it was about that two month, uh, two month time frame. The company, they were very flexible with the location shoot of the video. I actually had a um, a doctor's visit in Toronto at the time, and they scheduled their filming at the hotel that I was staying at. So uh, everything was just great. The crew came out uh, to do the video. Yeah, they were extremely kind, very knowledgeable, and so patient with everything. We just pretty much began talking about my experience, uh, starting from what happened uh, in my life prior to my diagnosis. And then going into the day that I was urgently having surgery, um, we talked about my treatment, how I felt. I was pretty much thrown into a bucket of the standard. Here's your six rounds of chemo. And I shared some of my photos that I took of myself throughout my journey with them so they could put that into their video and kind of spoke about the side effects. As I mentioned, they were just, for myself, they were just very agonizing and having an oncology team that wasn't there to support me uh, initially, that was very difficult. Uh, then we talked about how it took, again, it took me finding Ovarian Cancer Canada and OV Dialogue really saved me from being so shut away from everyone else. Like women were connecting with other women and they were getting answers on ovarian cancer. I wasn't. Uh, it was just, it was everything that I was really looking for. So um, you talked about uh, my message to the biopharmaceutical company. So, uh, you know, even the researchers that are there, even the scientists that were there, you have to do what you can. You need to continue that research to save our lives. Truly, you're, you're all the hope that we have. And it and if it isn't for a lot of those treatments, we have nothing. Um, I, I was just so humbled when that manager shared with me that my testimony touched everyone within the company and my message about women living with ovarian cancer, it was truly heard. 
They also requested to have another media opportunity with me later in this year. So I look forward to spreading more about our mission and really making that research a priority. And when we talk about this relationship, it really shows us how that the biopharmaceutical company, they recognize the value of the true patient partner experience and providing that realism uh, to their staff. Like we are far more than a research project. We're far more than getting another degree or getting a new drug. Like we are living with ovarian cancer. We're human beings and we want to live and we deserve the right to live another day. It was wonderful. Wow, it, it really sounds like a wonderful experience and such a powerful message you shared with the company. And I'm just happy to hear that this collaboration is continuing too. That's, that's awesome, awesome. So uh, Julie, we'll continue with you. So you recently spoke at the Let's Talk Cancer uh, event, which is a symposium for high school students that gives them the opportunity to learn about cancer from scientists in the field and patients living with the disease. Two of the graduate trainees um, that we're hearing from later tonight actually helped plan this event. So can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like sharing your story with this young generation and what message did you leave with them? Uh, well, I began by asking these 160 160 11th and 12th graders um, who amongst them had family members who had been affected by cancer diagnosis and nearly everyone put up their hand, maybe four or five didn't. And, uh, and then I narrated about how when I was their age, my family doctor advised my parents that I should receive a prophylactic mastectomy because uh, my mother had developed ovarian cancer, or sorry, had developed breast cancer at the age of 24, and I was the daughter who looked most like her, so he thought that I would be the one most likely to develop breast cancer. So my, my parents deferred on that decision, uh, thankfully, but that kind of got their attention. And from there, I told them the story of receiving a diagnosis at age 35, that it was thought to be, um, you know, late stage. It was stage four. I found it in my neck. I uh, wasn't expected to survive, but I did. And um, I framed my 20 minute talk uh, in terms of why I believed I was still alive 12 years after that initial diagnosis. And I'd had a brain metastasis and I'd had two subsequent lymphatic metastases. Um, but I identified three main families of causes and uh, the first I thought was that at the time of diagnosis in Ottawa, there was a nimble and responsive healthcare system, including specialists in gynae oncology. Um, secondly, I thought I was still here because of a wide spectrum of personal resources, which included my own inner capacity and resolve to become an informed patient engaged in my treatment and outcomes. As well, though, I had supports of my family, my husband, and many others. And then third was that I just happened to be riding on this wave of excellent timing that um, all, all along the stages of my journey, I was there where there was this emerging research and knowledge at each stage where, you know, novel um, maintenance therapies like the PARP inhibitor was available, a novel form of localized radiation was available. Um, Anyway, it, it gave a frame. And so more than being a sensational story for these students, my goal for the talk was to leave them with a the belief that pursuing a career in health sciences and specifically in gynae oncology could lead to a meaningful and impactful personal career for them. And I really left with the feeling that it gave them that message. That's amazing, Julie. I'm, I'm just so happy that you got to have that experience. and. Uh... And uh, so we are running out of time. I just want to make that one note. So Martha and Livia, I'm going to combine your question. Um, it's actually on the same thing. So Ovarian Cancer Canada is committed to supporting the young generation of scientists, the next generation. So you guys both, um, you both reviewed the Anita Unruh Prize, and this was established by Patrick McGrath in honor of his wife, who is actually a former associate dean and professor. And this award is, uh, this prize is awarded to an outstanding trainee. So you both reviewed the applications and helped select the award recipient. So can you both tell us a little bit about your experience? Um, hopefully a little bit shorter. So I'll start with Martha. <laughs> sure, I'm happy to. And I, I won't go into the kind of quick explanation as to how we um, 
determine scores. Uh, I will say that each of us were paired with another patient partner and together we had to arrive at a joint pair score. Um, and the winner was determined by the highest average score. So I'll just say it in one very short paragraph. Um, keen to alter the trajectory of the disease, mindful of the path ahead, aware of the statistics and sensitive to the challenges. My overall feeling, Jessica, was how impressive these PhD candidates were. The scope of all four were closely connected to ovarian cancer and relevant to the ovarian cancer research pillars. And yet each re represented a unique range of scientific hypothesis. Overall, I would say, Jessica, the future of research is well in hand. Awesome. And Livia, we'll finish with you. Yeah, I really echo what Martha stated there. Um, you know, from being able to collaborate on these remarkable research papers that we were taking a look at, it it, it was truly awe inspiring. And even from my perspective, from the medical field, I was able to recognize a lot of the content that was that was there, but being on the other side um, and being able to do this in a non judgmental uh, location. It was it was safe being amongst our colleagues. Um, you know, when it came time for us to all be together, uh, you know, we had to be able to defend a lot of our perspectives. And it also took us listening to each other. So we had to be really open minded. And it was it was just thinking that uh, in the end, like we all come from different backgrounds. Um, and experiences and to be able to unite on research related to this disease um, was truly inspiring, remarkable. That's great. It, it sounds like an awesome experience. So we're going to wrap up this question, uh, this session. So I, I'd like to thank each of our panelists today for speaking to us and giving us just a glimpse of the type of research opportunities that you can be engaged in as a patient partner in research. And so we're currently looking to expand our team. If you're interested in learning more about the patient partners and research program, my contact information is now there on our uh, on the slide there. Um, so please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. So and thank you. And I'll hand that back over to Steph then. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to thank you again, Jessica, Martha, Julie, and Livia for being so open with us. Um, I'm going to be honest, I found myself fighting back tears in that session, but you know what, they weren't tears of sadness, but of hope and inspiration, just at hearing your personal stories and your involvement in this exciting research. So again, if people out there watching are interested in learning more about the Patient Partners in Research program, Jessica's information is on the screen. We're also going to put her email in the chat box so you can please reach out to her. So with that, we are going to take our first break of the evening. So I will welcome you to join Cheryl Paul, who is a cancer survivor and owner of Wildflower Yoga Studio in Calgary, Alberta, who will be leading us in some gentle stretching. And we are going to get started again in five minutes. We're running a few minutes behind. So we're going to try to come back at 5.03. Hi there, I'm Cheryl Paul with Wildflower Yoga in Calgary, Alberta. I'm here to give you a little five minute break from your desk. So if you could come to standing. And let's just take a few nice deep breaths here. Inhale through the nose. And exhale through the nose. And just kind of shake things out. Step your feet a few times, and then wherever they sort of comfortably land, you're going to stand like that. And then notice the soles of your feet on the ground. Maybe wiggle your toes around a little bit to relax them. And then we're going to let our weight come a little bit forward to the front of the feet, a little bit over to the left, back through the heels, and over to the right. And let's just do a few circles like that, almost like you're just doing little ankle circles and the rest of the body's following along. Good, and let's change the direction. Good, 
Okay, and come back to center. And we're gonna take a little bit deeper breaths now. So nice big inhale through the nose. Hold. And fully exhale. Out the mouth. So keep exhaling until you're all out. And then inhale through the nose. Nice big exhale. Last one. And let's take some shoulder circles. Inhale, shoulders up towards your ears. Exhale, squeeze them on your back behind you and then reach down. As big a range of motion as you comfortably can. So you'll notice as I'm doing this, I'm trying to keep the rest of my body still. So the movement is isolated to the shoulders. And then let's reverse that. Good. Arms at your sides. All right, let's bring the left ear toward the left shoulder and then reach your right fingertips down towards your right knee. And just feel this nice little stretch through the neck, maybe even through the shoulder a little bit. And then you're going to turn your nose down to look at your left shoulder. And then come back to a neutral position. And then you're going to follow your left fingertips down your left leg. And you can stay like this or lift your right arm up alongside your ear. Bring your arm down, bring yourself back up. We'll do the other side. So right ear to right shoulder, reach the left fingertips down and just hold in a stretch. And then turn your nose down, looking at your right shoulder. Good. And then head back to neutral, reach those right fingertips down towards your right knee. And stay like this or lift that left arm up and reach. Good. And then lower your arm down, coming back up. Nice big smile, a couple of shoulder rolls, and you're ready to get back at it. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, for leading us through that stretch. I hope that you all feel relaxed and that you had a chance to grab a beverage and are now ready for the second half of our evening. I would now like to introduce you to Ovarian Cancer Canada's CEO, Tanya Brionis. Tanya will share Ovarian Cancer Canada's way forward and how we and our community are going to demand action, deliver change, and transform lives. Tanya, I'll have a small technology glitch. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Brionis, and I'm the CEO of Ovarian Cancer Canada. I've been with the organization now since August 2021, and a time sure has flown by. In, in many ways, it seems like yesterday, and a lot has changed, though, since those first days. But what hasn't changed, probably what's only grown ever so much, is my determination to really empower this community, achieve impact, affect change, and, and make a difference for those affected by this disease. So I'm so pleased to be here at our research forum, and I'm really pleased to be talking to you about our path forward. But before, we do, before I do, I do want to take a moment to sincerely thank all of you for being a part of our community and supporting this important work. While I can't see all of your faces tonight, I know that so many of you have taken time out of your day to join us. We have our, our Teal sisters, our family and friends, donors, partners, and our researchers. By registering for tonight's event and just by being here, each and every one of you is showing your commitment to this cause and your own motivation to further progress against this disease. And that just makes me so proud. So if we can move to the next slide. The, the last few weeks, and, and quite frankly, the last few months have been uh, such a whirlwind for the team and, and certainly for, for me personally. Uh, May 8th was World Ovarian Cancer Day, and, and what a tremendous example of the power of our community. So many people from across the country, from across the world, shared their stories, talking to live television, newspaper, radio, social media. It, it really has been incredible to see this cause highlighted so boldly and so authentically. So thank you. Thank you, all of you, for raising your your voice. And thank you, of course, for donating to support this cause and encouraging others to join you. 
I also had the pleasure of attending our Lady Ball event galas in both Halifax and Charlottetown, the return to the runway. And let me tell you, the, the East Coast sure knows how to throw a party, but also how to raise a ton of money at the same time for a really important cause. So thank you to all who were involved in that. Our team in Montreal also hosted for the first time ever an event that brought two worlds together, the art community and our Teal Sisters. And it really was the beginning of what is a beautiful relationship. And certainly last, uh, last but certainly not least, we launched res registration for the 2023 Ovarian Cancer Canada Walk of Hope coming up this September. Our longstanding walk teams are back and setting the bar even higher for their fundraising goals. Our Teal Sisters are, are eagerly waiting to see each other again and we're rallying local businesses together to join this event. And I just can't wait to see what unfolds on walk day. Each of these events, whether it happens in your community, across the country or online, really is an opportunity to make ovarian cancer a priority. And that's exactly what we're doing tonight. We're accelerating progress and we're creating impact. Let's move to the next slide. Before we jump into where we're headed, which I'm really, really excited to tell you about, let's take a moment though to celebrate where we've come from and what we've accomplished. Ovarian Cancer Canada is funding research that really is setting the stage for future discoveries. You've already heard about this tonight from my colleagues who are driving Ovarian Cancer Canada's OVCAN research initiative, but what does this mean for the organization, for us? The progress that we've made in the research labs and leading institution transcends communities far and wide. Our research knows no bounds and it has led to new discoveries. We've earned international recognition for Canada as a leader in pioneering transformative research and discoveries. And to be able to build on this momentum is nothing short of groundbreaking. It is proof that when we put our leading minds together, bring our efforts together and come together as a community, just like we are tonight, we really can make change a reality. And there's no time like the present to make our unwavering commitment to research. You deserve nothing less. Next slide. That's why we've really been taking a critical look at our work and we've made and will continue to make strategic and very well informed choices about who we are as an organization, how we need to evolve and grow, and how we can make the greatest impact to achieve our winning aspiration. So we're evaluating our work very critically, what we've been doing, what we must continue, and what we need to reimagine. So just imagine what can come next. We're setting a very ambitious direction for the future that's informed by you, members of our community and dedicated supporters. So in doing that, what, what, one of the tools that we did, we conducted a survey for anyone within our community and those outside of our community to share their feedback, what they want and expect of us. These are some of the comments that you'll see on your, on your, on your screen of things that we heard. We held focus groups just discussing different directions. We've brought leading minds together to confront our challenges and our opportunities head on. And we heard you loud and clear. So that's why I'm so excited to be here with you tonight to share Ovarian Cancer Canada's plans for the future. And I want you to hear it from me first because I will be asking and hoping to count on you to help push our mission forward. We are a growing force poised for action and we're committed to meeting the diverse needs and voices of this community. Ovarian cancer is not a disease that should be overlooked as a priority and we will demand the action and the attention that we deserve. We'll be bolder, breaking through the clutter, disrupting the norm, we are going to keep pushing forward stronger and more determined than ever. We will be the change makers that you need us to be. We will raise our voices louder and we won't stop until we're heard. Next slide. We know what, what we need, what you expect of us, and we are listening. This is our rallying cry, our manifesto. At Ovarian Cancer Canada, we reject the notion that ovarian cancer can't be eradicated. We are here to demand action, deliver change, and transform lives. We stand hand in hand with the people experiencing, affected by or at risk of the disease, and we will not rest until women are able to live their lives freely, fully, and uninhibited by ovarian cancer. Next slide. We've said it already, we have big plans and big aspirations, and believe me, we're here to do the work. Our mission, our core work, and the reason we exist is to boldly and unapologetically take action against ovarian cancer until the number of deaths from this disease is zero. I get goosebumps every time I say it. If you hear my voice shaking, it is something that I'm very, very proud to embrace this mission for Ovarian Cancer Canada. Next slide. 
you're probably wondering, of course, how we're going to do this. So I do want to take some time, although I recognize that we don't have a whole lot of time to dive deep into this, but I want to walk you through at a very high level the five-year strategic plan that we've put into place. And I want you to know that these words that you're reading on the slide and hearing from me are more than just words. They are actions. When we began developing our strategic plan, we had to focus on where we wanted to go, a future-oriented statement about the aspiration of our organization. And we asked ourselves, what does winning mean for us? What do we strive to accomplish through, through this strategic plan? And our winning aspiration is that we will be the ovarian cancer research engine that sustainably drives health outcomes, influences system changes, and improves the quality of life for women with ovarian cancer and those at high risk of the disease. Next slide. Every single action, every milestone is going to bring us closer to our goal. And I'm going to walk you through our eight strategic directions, recognizing that one is no more important than the other. They are all dependent on one another. The Ovarian Cancer Canada team shares the roles and responsibilities together. And we hope that you will also see yourself in our work and what we are setting out to accomplish. One of the strategic directions that you see on the screen may encompass several different initiatives. And, and I, I look forward to a time where we can dive deeper and would love to have ongoing conversations about this. This is really meant to be just a high level snapshot of our ultimate intentions that will allow us to achieve our winning aspirations. So first, we will improve patient outcomes along the ovarian, entire ovarian cancer continuum, from prevention to diagnosis, to treatment, to survivorship, through scientific discoveries and breakthroughs. We will positively impact disease prevention, time to diagnosis, and access to treatments by making system changes. We will improve access to care and enhance the quality of life for people with or at high risk of the disease. And we will provide information, education, vital support and resources to and ensure that there are opportunities to build a community so that no one experiences this disease alone. Next slide. To do our work, we will aggressively grow and diversify our revenue streams. We will make ovarian cancer, can cancer a top of mind issue in Canada and inspire more support for ovarian cancer Canada in order to enable us to do this work. Today, every dollar that, that is, every dollar is so much harder to earn, but the appreciation that we have for every dollar donated is, is even greater. And the voices of our community will be amplified in all of our work and in the work with our partners. Without you, this would not be possible. Next slide. And we, there is a great urgency to our work and a momentum that cannot be stopped. And in order to achieve this, we will build the optimal internal infrastructure to equip our organization for the long term. We will foster innovation, agility, and a growth mindset within our team. Our collective perseverance is absolutely essential to achieving our goals. And next slide. And our goal, our ultimate goal, our vision, we have a vision, a vision of a future where ovarian cancer is preventable, curable, and ultimately eradicated, but we're not going to be able to do it alone. Next slide. We don't just hope, we know that our community will stand with us, raise your voices, commit to change, and help us achieve our goals. Every action you take brings us one step closer. Thank you. Thank you for your support and entrusting Ovarian Cancer Canada to be the go-to organization when it comes to ovarian cancer. We are in your corner. We are here for you. We are demanding action for you and for everyone affected by this disease. Trust us as we take our job so seriously. We will not rest until the number of deaths from this disease is zero. Thank you for your time and commitment to our future. It's been a pleasure to share this with you tonight. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing that exciting path forward for Ovarian Cancer Canada. Um, the goosebumps are real. I listened to it in the chat as well. Uh, the time for change is now. Thank you also for confirming that ovarian cancer research is and will continue to be a priority and be at the core of our mission and our investments. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Jeanette Boudreau. Dr. Boudreau is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Dalhousie University in Halifax and the Scientific Director of the Beatrice Hunter Cancer Research Institute. Tonight, she is going to share about the research she is doing on immunotherapies in ovarian cancer. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Boudreau. Hello. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. 
I'm just going to quickly set myself up and you can give me the thumbs up if this looks good. Looks great. Awesome. All right. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to come here tonight and talk to you a little bit about not just the work that we're doing, but the work that um, my fellow immunologists and I are doing to try to battle um, this absolutely terrible disease that has uh, th this really putting up a fight, um, if I'm being honest. Um, so I am an immunologist and I come to my training uh, as an immunologist and something that we know to be true is that the immune system, you know, sort of has our back most of the time. Um, we just kind of don't notice it. It's keeping us from developing cancer and it's actually the rare occurrence that we get uh, cancer as a disease. So it's always there. We just don't always notice it. And this is a this is a complicated side, and I'm not going to apologize for that because the immune system is a complicated thing. And just looking at all the players on these slides, you start to appreciate that um, tackling a disease with the immune system, which is what we're trying to accomplish with immunotherapy, is a team sport and requires a collaborative effort. And nobody does that better than Ovarian Cancer Canada and the OVCAN research team behind it. But let me start by taking a step back and explaining to you what we mean by cancer immunosurveillance. This is what inspires us to think that we can use the immune system to cure cancer. The fundamentals are that the immune system is always patrolling the body. And every time cells divide and heal and renew themselves, which happens in all of us all the time, there's a, ris there's a risk that something goes wrong and it happens often enough that one of the lines of defenses that we have is the immune system. So constantly these things are happening, the tumor is trying to develop and the immune system is knocking it, knocking it down over and over again. So that's what happens in this first stage, this elimination phase. Um, something happens, the immune system would rather not have it, it gets rid of it. That's immunosurveillance and that's what your immune system is supposed to do. But every now and then something happens and the tumor does something really clever and a cell acquires a mutation or some feature that lets it duck the immune system or maybe just coexist in a stalemate. And that's when you get to stage two, equilibrium. At this point, nobody knows you have cancer yet. In fact, it's probably happening in multiple sites in multiple people um, that are here tonight. But at this phase, it's equilibrium. This isn't bad yet. This is just the immune system stalemating with something that wants to be a tumor. It's only a problem when we get to stage three, and that's the escape phase, when the tumor manages to do something that escapes recognition by the immune system. It acquires a mutation, it uh, hides out, it builds a wall around itself, or it changes an environment that says to the immune system, hey, this isn't something you need to pay attention to, just go away quietly, right? It takes advantages of mechanisms that exist in all of us to prevent us having you know, too strong an immune response all the time or having an autoimmune disease all the time. But nevertheless, this is proof of principle that you know, the immune system actually is capable of recognizing and ridding the body of tumors. It does it all the time. Now, we talk about tumors and we think about it as this, you know, ball of cells that we would rather not have that's growing and interrupting function, but it actually is just a really busy ecosystem. There's dynamic things happening all the time. It's this, you know, sort of city of cells that are existing inside the body, and it's got layers and layers to protect itself from being eliminated um, by the immune system and other mechanisms. So it's got tumor cells, but it's also built itself this thing we call a stroma. That's like a wall around it, and it needs food and it needs supplies. So it recruits blood vessels to grow into it, and it even recruits immune cells, but it reprograms the immune system for its own benefit. So rather than having the immune system attack and kill and eliminate the tumor cells, the tumor actually co-ops mechanisms that we use for things like healing and regulation and preventing excessive inflammation. And it uses those things to its own advantage so that it can keep growing and developing and getting bigger and bigger. This is a, you know, over on the left, I've got a picture of a tumor that I took from a manuscript, but over on the right, this is a picture that was taken by one of the grad students in my lab. Every color represents a different kind of cell. And this is a picture of a tumor. And just look at this mess. It's, it's you know, this heterogeneous collection of cells that all have different things that they can do. This tumor has a lot of immune cells in it. That's what all those colored dots look like, but that's not always the case. And in fact, we have different kinds of tumors and we can talk about them in terms of, of temperature, which is really just a measure of how many immune cells are in there. So what's the, what's the game plan and what soldiers do we have that we can maybe recruit? All right, 
I'll cool it with the science for a minute and show you some, some of these pictures. So I'm gonna put it into three categories and we call this the temperature of the tumor. The colder the tumor, the fewer the immune cells, the less likely it is that the tumor is going to have an immune response against it unless we intervene. So we have these things called immune deserts. They're the coldest tumors, they've got no immune cells in them. Then we have these warm tumors, which are, if they've got immune cells and they're right knocking up against the door, but they're not quite in the tumor. And then we have these inflamed ones and those ones are really hot and they've got immune cells all integrated in those cities of tumors. And you can probably appreciate that that's three very different scenarios. I can wake up the immune system, but it's not gonna do me any good if there's no immune cells in the tumor. And if you don't have any immune cells in your tumor, then maybe I need to think about a therapy that's gonna bring the immune cells into the tumor before I can even start thinking about how to heat them up. So it's the case with ovarian cancer. Everything, everywhere, all at once. It turns out that if you, you know, look into a patient's tumor, they have cold tumors, they have warm tumors, and they have hot tumors, and it's not uncommon to have more than one in the same patient. As the tumor grows and metastasizes and constantly fights with the immune system, different parts of it develop different strategies for keeping the immune system at bay. And so this is just taken from um, a paper and every one of these bars represents an individual's tumor. And you can see that those individuals sometimes have all hot tumors and sometimes have all cold tumors, but look at all the patients on the right side of this graph. They have a combination of, of more than one tumor. So how do we think about this? How do we you know, battle this tumor when we, we're gonna need more than one approach all happening at once? Because if you don't get rid of the whole tumor, it's got a high likelihood of coming back. All right, so that's, that's a little doom and gloom, but it hopefully sets the stage for why this has been such a challenge um, to target uh, ovarian cancers. And I think it's true of the immune system, but remember I said the immune system was always there and always watching out. It turns out it's also a collaborator in all of the therapies that might be effective. Successful chemo and successful radiation in other, in other cancers actually in part wake up the immune system and get the immune system involved in helping to fight the tumor too. They're there and they're helping. So, okay, how do we, how do we start to think about this intelligently? I, I probably can't do that level of microscopy on every patient. I would love to be able to tailor a therapy, but how do I actually do this in a way that's scalable and accessible? And one of the approaches that we're taking to this is starting to think about the genetic features of each patient's tumor. So what drives that tumor? And we've all heard of things like BRCA mutations and um, changes in the way that the tumor might be growing. And so there are ways that we can start to predict the immune activity in tumors based on the genetics that underpin those tumors. So depending on whether or not you have a mutation starts to predict how hot a tumor will be, starts to predict what type of therapy might actually be useful, sort of. But wait, there's more. I told you that we can have immune cells in our tumor. I told you you can have a hot tumor, but the reality is that those are still tumors. These are still patients that are presenting with tumors. So if there are immune cells in the tumor, why aren't they doing their job? What are, what is going wrong? Right. And there's a, a bazillion reasons for that. <laughs> the first are these things called immunologic checkpoints. These are things like PD-1 and CTLA-4 and TIM-3 and TIGIT. Um, these are things that normally exist to stop the immune system from attacking your body in a way that it shouldn't. So blocking these is one approach that we have for helping to cure tumors. Here's another thing it does. It messes up the, metab the metabolic area in the tumor. So rather than being supportive of immune function, it actually detracts from the immune, immune function. It makes the tumor feel tired and lazy and you know, sort of think about that feeling that you get when you go for a big long run and then you can't lift your legs the next day because they're full of lactic acid. That's what's happening inside your tumor. It's just getting really lazy and you know, sort of providing a crummy diet that makes the immune system not want to do anything. And then here's another problem. This is the tumor kind of sending out messages in the form of cytokines. Think of cytokines as like little Twitter messages between cells. And these cytokines are sending signals that say, don't respond, don't react. In fact, suppress other cells if they're trying to react. And again, these things exist for a good reason. You don't want your immune system to be on all the time. But when the tumor co-ops these mechanisms, it allows the tumor to continue to grow and establish more and more, you know, sort of uh, territory and take over more and more of your nutrients. 
okay, so what can we do about this? There's, there's lots of things we can do about this to try to wake up the immune system. And I have a very broad definition of what immunotherapy is. I think most of the time when people talk about immunotherapy, especially in the clinical space, they're talking about checkpoint blockades. So things like nivolumab and ipilimumab. These are things that interfere with those checkpoints, those uh, little things that are telling the immune system to stop being activated um, in the tumor. So if you can interfere with the stop signals, then you can let the cells continue on and do the thing that they're going to do. Now, as you know, these have worked exceptionally well in certain types of cancer, but in ovarian cancer, it's only worked in a subset of patients. More on that later. But there's other things we can do, right? So we can say, you know, hey, immune system, react to this. And we can try to bring the immune system into the tumor if the tumor is cold or the immune system's not working properly. So we can do things like drop antibodies into a patient. Uh, so in ovarian cancer, the antibodies might be against things like mesothelin or the folate receptor. And they kind of work, but they don't work as well as something like rituximab or Herceptin slam dunks in the cancer immunotherapy world. Okay, so maybe we need something a little stronger. Um, and, and I'm gonna say that these could be things like CAR T cells. So these are lymphocytes that have been engineered to be super powered immune cells that have been given a very clear directive to go in and hunt for the tumor. And again, those um, are now you know, programmed, they're killing, they're resistant to immunosuppressive mechanisms and they might even be able to get into the tumor if the tumor is cold. And finally, this, this last one, and this is one of the more promising ones in ovarian cancer, are TIL therapy, so tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. So all we're doing in these is we're taking the lymphocytes or the immune cells out of a patient's tumor, growing them up in the lab, reinvigorating them, feeding them, making them really strong, and then dropping them back into the patients in the hope that they'll be able to go um, you know, fight the tumor and, and collaborate in getting rid of it. But these are not perfect and they don't work in everybody and we need better ways to predict what's going to work in who and how much. And if you, you know, sort of have had a chance to look at my potential pitfalls, they're not without risk. There's risk of autoimmune diseases. There's risk of developing secondary cancers. They're expensive and they're not available in all sites yet. So we're not there yet, but the fact that they work in some patients tells us that maybe we can get there if we can understand the patients better. So here's immune checkpoint blockade, up close and personal. This won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. It was so impactful and it continues to be impactful and used in more and more cancers. But like I mentioned in ovarian cancer, it's not really doing as well. In a subset of patients, it's somewhere between 10 and 15% of patients with high grade serous ovarian cancer, there is a response and those patients do better and survive longer and have you know, fewer side effects and that's fantastic. We don't have great ways of predicting who those patients are yet, but again, it generates optimism in my mind that assigned correctly or given with the right combination of therapies, there's a way to get the immune system to do its job against ovarian cancer. So that works sometimes, but maybe that doesn't work because there's not the right immune cells in the tumor and maybe we have to give the immune cells those tumors. So here's those CAR T cells up close and I'm going to say that we can also make CAR macrophages and CAR NK cells. And those are just two other types of immune cells. But the trick with those is that those, unlike the T cells, which have to be made for every single patient one by one, can be made for multiple patients at once. So I personally think that they're the future, and this is what my lab works on. But what we don't know about how to program these yet is how to make them the most resilient cells when they get into the tumor microenvironment. So how do we make it so that they can target the tumor cells while resisting all of those signals to become lazy and to become inhibited? So we're doing this by genetically engineering these cells to make them stronger and more resilient without making them too overpowering. So where do we go from here? I've told you that the disease is hard and that we don't have super great targets and we don't have a slam dunk antibody and we don't know how to predict who's going to respond to what. And I think that actually reflects some challenges that the tumor itself has. These tumors mutate and they change and they grow and develop to a point where they're really hard to treat before they even get noticed. I'm sure that many, many of the people on this call have a similar story, which is it took so long to diagnose my disease because my symptoms were so unspecific. So, you know, here's what we're dealing with, right? These advanced tumors that have poor immune cell infiltration or anti-cancer function that have already diversified, making them really hard to treat with one single agent therapy. 
And to top it all off, they've developed these mechanisms to try to overcome the immune system and suppress it. So I don't think that the cure for ovarian cancer is one thing. I think it's a combination of things. We just have to be really smart to outsmart the tumor. All right. So how do we begin to do that? Well, maybe we can combine it with stuff that we're giving to patients anyway, right? So here's some data from a study in um, platinum chemotherapy. These patients received neoadjuvant chemo, so that means before uh, their surgery. And what we found was that in these patients, they actually had a higher um, infiltration of immune cells in their tumor. In other words, giving patients chemotherapy helped to heat up the tumor. They opened up the door for the immune system to get in. So what if we could then take the immune system and make it so that it's armed and really excited about killing tumor cells before we gave them the, the, the chemotherapy so that when the immune cells got in there, they could do their job. And we're working on some of these ideas in my lab. Okay, what if we, what if we put them in with some PARP inhibitors? So we know that those are, are having good outcomes for a subset of patients. Can we, can we make the tumor you know, more interesting to the immune system with PARP inhibitors? And it turns out that we can. So look at all these clinical trials coming up the side here. These are all clinical trials that are testing different versions of PARP inhibitors plus those immunologic checkpoints. So what they're saying is, when the PARP inhibitors help to amplify the DNA damage and make the, the tumor more interesting to the immune system, why not support the immune system at that point by cutting off all of the mechanisms that start to inhibit it? And I'm you know, really excited to see the outcomes of these trials because I think it's a really clever way to combine stuff. Okay, we've talked a lot about T cells, but what about some other immune cells? So I like natural killer cells, others like these macrophages, and you can sort of see that they have their own interesting properties. So the macrophages, I think of them as like the Kool-Aid men. They just, they come in and they're loud and they're, you know, the life of the party, um, but that's inflammatory. And that's good because you want immune cells in your tumor and you want a cell that's going to break down the fences and help to let them in. And that's what Max do really well. Or you could use NK cells, my personal favorite. And these are sort of like the Swiss army knife of the immune system. So unlike the T cells that we hear so much about, the NK cells have all these different tools and they pull them out and use them in combination in different ways. And so rather than targeting one thing, you can target like 20 different things at once. And so as the tumor tries to diversify and run away, there's probably an NK cell to meet it there. And this is, this is data that just came from um, a study that was done in my lab on uh, patients with ovarian cancer. And we just looked to see like what types of cells are actually beneficial in patients. And look at this, it turns out it's the, it's the NK cells. When we have those in the tumor, those are the patients that have um, higher overall survival. You wanna to be to the left of this line. So we think that there's some promise there in NK cells and that's what my lab is really, really working on um, activating for ovarian cancer in collaboration with a lot of the OVCAN network investigators. Okay, a couple more opportunities here. Uh, these are bikes and bites and trikes. These are just fancier antibodies that grab the immune system and says, say, hey, look here and kill this. And it gives it ways to do this. So it takes a couple of antibodies that don't work so well on their own and it combines them together, bringing together the best of both worlds. So it forces the immune system to interact with the tumor cells and then interferes with the inhibition of those immune system uh, cells at the same time, hopefully lowering the threshold and helping the immune system to see. Or maybe we could make those cells really, really, really resilient to the metabolic reprogramming. So we all know that person that can manage to go to a cocktail party and not actually eat any of the cocktail snacks. We can make NK cells that aren't interested in candy. And it turns out that when you do that, these are some mice with tumors. When you do that, you can actually have, uh, in this case, it's NK cells, but you could pick any immune cell you want and you can make them resilient. So even though the tumor tries to shut them down, they're resistant to that. In sum, I think that the, the future of ovarian cancer therapy is going to be to bring together really logical approaches that combine classical therapy with immunotherapy, putting them together at the time when the tumor is most vulnerable. So we kind of deliver a one, two punch or maybe a three, four, five punch. There's a lot of challenges that we know to be true of of tumors in general, but especially in ovarian cancer. And so what my group and others are trying to do is really understand what those things are so that we can figure out what the right treatment is for every patient with this disease. And I'll end on some work that we've done in collaboration with Ovarian Cancer Canada and a group called Oceans that we started out here in Nova Scotia, where we're looking at individual patients' tumors to understand what the features are and then hopefully figure out how to target them. 
Uh, this is T Slice. You're going to hear more about this from Morgan, uh, my student, who will present later on, and she literally invented this. So the best way I have to describe what she did is this little thing that comes in on the top of your pizza and protects the lid from squishing your pizza. But it's a clear glass chip, and she puts it, she 3D prints it, and puts it on top of um, a patient's ovarian tumor. So all of that heterogeneity that exists within inside the tumor continues to exist in a dish. And now we can make avatars of patients and we can make many avatars of patients. So we can try out different things and see in real time how the tumor evolves. Morgan's a bit of a nerd. So she 3D printed this. She has made, I don't know how many iterations of this, but she's finally landed on what I call the cake pan display where she can print it and pop them out. Um, and she can make hundreds of these, and we're actually about to go up to a scale of thousands. So Morgan is not only able to do this, but this device is so simple, and it plays so nicely with things we already have in the lab, that we're starting to distribute it to those collaborators that I was telling you about, who have different approaches to treating ovarian cancer so that they can test their things in our cool new model system. And that level of collaboration is really characteristic of what we're doing in the OVCAN network. Finally, last slide, just because I like data, uh, we're missing some of the labels, but all of this is to show you that the different regions within the tumor have different characteristics. Wherever you see green, those are cells that are proliferating rapidly like a tumor cell does. And as Morgan moves from the outside to the inside of this T-slice device, she creates the same gradients of tumor um, proliferation that we see in a real patient tumor when we do those slides that I showed you earlier on. So that's where I'm gonna stop, but I'm happy to take your questions um, from the chat or feel free to reach out to me by email and I will touch base. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your energy. I love that presentation, <laughs> it was awesome. Um, so we've had a lot of questions in there. Alicia's been doing some good work at answering some of those, but I have one here. Uh, are you looking at the role of various probiotics or gut microbiome relative to the success of various immunotherapies? Sounds like some interesting research happening in that direction. So not me, but my colleagues. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. So the, the microbiome um, influences how well those immunotherapies are the checkpoints that I showed you. So patients who don't have a really healthy microbiome, which can be a result of their own lifestyle choices, but more often than not is a result of being on antibiotics because you're on therapy and that changes the way that you respond to immunotherapy. So we're really interested in this and we're talking to many of our colleagues and starting to actually collect stool samples from patients at the time of surgery so that those who know how to actually study these things can tell us what those microbes are doing and the, the metabolites that they're creating. And we can put those kind of in combination with our T-slice systems to start to understand how the microbiome, so all those microbes are conditioning the metabolic environment. And remember I said the metabolic environment changes how how excited the immune cells are to behave in the tumor. So, so I'm not doing it, but I'm aware of it. And we're starting to collaborate to start to get at some of those questions. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, hearing more from Morgan right after the break. So that's all the time we have for questions for now. Uh, if you do have further questions, you can put them in the chat and we will do our best to get those answered throughout the night or after. Um, and again, Dr. Pedro, I just want to really thank you so much for bringing that presentation to life um, and making it so we could understand it. So thank you for that. Um, before we head into our next break, I am going to just post one more poll question that uh, I would love to get your feedback on. Um, this is just getting your feedback on some of the topics that you would like to hear about at future sessions. So from the list below, you can set, select as many of these as are of interest to you. I'm just going to read through them and please take just a minute to uh, go through and answer these. So traveling after a cancer diagnosis, managing menopause, exploring complementary therapies, understanding the importance of the pelvic floor, tools for having a meaningful conversation with your healthcare team, life after treatment, what's next? Uh, advocacy update, what's happening. And if you have any other suggestions that aren't on this list, if you want to please put those in the chat and we will make sure that we capture those. Like I said, they really just help us to shape future events so we can make sure that we're giving you the sessions that you want to hear about. So with that, we are going to take another very short break and Cheryl is going to lead us in a few more stretches and we'll get started again in about seven minutes at 5.48.
Paul with Wildflower Yoga in Calgary, Alberta, and here is your 10-minute desk break. Um, so let's start by just moving yourself a little bit forward in your seat so that your feet are solid on the floor. You're going to start to press into your left foot, lift your right foot up, bring your knee in toward your chest, and you can either hold like this and continue to have the support of your hand or release your hands and then set the leg down. And then we're gonna step out a little bit to the right, lift your knee up again, you can use your hands to support or release. And bring that down, one more time out to the side, lift the leg up, maybe release, and then set your foot down. Bring your leg back to center. Same thing on the other side, lift the knee up and hold, maybe release your leg and set that down over to the left lift up maybe let go and release down one more time lift up maybe use the support of your hand release and bring that down good legs forward we're going to come on up to standing And then just as we were practicing sitting down, so you're gonna have your left hand on your chair, bring your right knee up and then extend it to straight and back behind you. Like you're doing a little kick back. So we go up, down and back. Two more like that. And set your right foot down, give yourself a little wiggle out. Notice how your right hip is feeling, how your left hip's feeling, maybe even how the soles of your feet are feeling on the floor. And then let's step to the other side of the chair. You've got your right hand on the chair for support. So lift the left knee up, extend it back, and up, and back. And two more like that. and arms down and then again using your chair bringing your hands to the back so remember if you pull back on your chair it's not going to be very stable for you you'll pull the front legs off so whenever you're using your weight on your chair you want to be pushing down and forward because then the chair is not going to go anywhere and then this is completely dependent upon how your shoulders feel you're pressing into the heels of your hands lifting the shoulders up and dropping your chin down so it looks like this from the side. And then you might go ahead and move a little bit further back. So it's a little bit like a downward dog. And let's take a few nice big breaths into the side ribs and the back ribs. and then come on up step a little bit forward so if you're at all familiar with the cat cow we're going to be doing the cat cow in this lifted variation you press the heels of the hands down to lift the upper back and then you start to gently set your shoulders down and then open your chest and gaze forward so the support in the hands the whole time a little bit of weight in your arms and try to stay evenly weighted through your feet so we can isolate this movement to your upper back. Let's do three more like that. Okay, and then Come on up to standing. So when we're staring at our computer for a long time, sometimes our eyes need a little bit of a break. So you're going to take your right finger in front of you and then focus on your finger. And we're going to try to keep your head in the same position. And you're going to turn your eyes and go as far over to the right as you can. So you might be tempted to turn your head, but just turn your eyes. And then when you get to that end range of motion, hold there and feel that strong, Work in the eyes to keep over to the right. 
And then you're going to try to keep your eyes focused on your finger as you slowly move back to center. And turn the palm of your hand down. And we're going to do that same thing with the finger going up. So again, keep your chin and nose in the same position. And track and watch your finger up until, again, you get that strong tension through the eyes looking up. And then watch your finger back through center. And then again, all the way down, holding that end range look. And then back to center, release your hand down. Okay, then let's try left hand, finger in front of you. We're gonna start to watch that finger go all the way to the left. Hold that strong gaze when you get to your end range. And then watch your finger come back to center. Focus, turn your palm down, lift up, hold. Again, resist the urge to tilt your head up. And then lower down to center. And then keep going all the way down. Look, look, look. And then back up to center, release down. And then just look at something far away in your room. And then look at something close up. And then closer still. And then from that close one to medium range away to far. And then just relax your eyes. Give yourself a good little shake out. Okay. Last thing we're going to do is just move the ankles a little bit. So hand on the chair for support. You're going to lift up onto the balls of your feet. Hold and slowly lower down. Let's just repeat that a few times. Feel that nice strong contraction through the calves up on tippy toes and then release. Let's do five more like that. I can shake that out. Have a little walk around. Do go and get a nice big drink of water. And thank you so much for playing along. Welcome back. And thank you, Cheryl, so much for stretching us out over the break. I truly appreciated the eye exercise. I've never done those before. I also wanted to thank everybody for sharing your insights into different topics that you're interested in. Um, our team will use this information as we plan future educational and support events. So joining us now are exceptional trainees in ovarian cancer research. They join us tonight from labs and hospitals across the country to share what drew them into this field, the important and exciting work that they're conducting, and how they hope to positively impact women living with ovarian cancer. Moderating this session, we have Dr. Alicia Tone, OVCAN Project Manager and Scientific Advisor with Ovarian Cancer Canada, whom we've heard from earlier and who has also been very busy answering questions. So thank you, Alicia. And Alicia will be joined by Donna Pepin. Donna is a Teal sister who was diagnosed in 2006. Since 2008, she has worked tirelessly for this cause, speaking in a variety of different community settings. As an advocate and public speaker, Donna's goal has been the same for 15 years, to raise awareness of this disease in Canada by educating women, the general public, and medical professionals. Today, Donna is a patient representative on the OVCAN Governing Council, and she also serves as a patient co-lead for Ovarian Cancer Canada's Patient Partners and Research Team. Welcome, Donna and Alicia. Thank you, Stephanie, and hello to the ovarian cancer community across Canada and everywhere else. My name is Donna Pepin, and I was diagnosed with a rare ovarian cancer almost 17 years ago in 2006. 
And after a year of chemotherapies and surgery, I was able to live cancer free for nine years. But like many of us, or most of us, my disease came back. And in 2016, I was diagnosed with recurrent metastatic ovarian cancer. My type of disease is low-grade serous. It's a rare one that affects fewer than 5% of all ovarian cancer patients. I am currently living with my disease, and I'm a patient at Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto. I was shocked when my disease recurred, but I was even more shocked when I learned that 10 years after my original diagnosis, the standard of care for my disease had not changed. The standard of care was the same as it had been in 2006. There were no new treatments, no new data for my disease, nothing had changed, and my disease had remained understudied and misunderstood. I think my story perfectly illustrates the desperate need for research. And my story is one of thousands of stories just like it. As a volunteer with Ovarian Cancer Canada, the work I am most proud of is as a member of our National Patient Partners and Research Team. As a team, we are honored to be the voices of ovarian cancer patients across Canada. We have the opportunity to tell science what we need and about what's important to ovarian cancer patients. As a team, we have influenced the direction of research. The power of our voices is indisputable. Rare disease trials are coming and they are coming because of us. The face of our disease is finally changing because of research. And so today I'm excited to introduce to you three very special young Canadian women. Please meet Emma Gerber, Morgan Pugh Toole, and Dahlia Ibrahim. They are all research trainees and each are working towards their own individual degrees. They are training in laboratories, conducting research, gathering data, analyzing research, and each of them is working towards their own specific research goal. And I like to think of our research trainees as our future knowledge makers. So let's meet them. And we'll start with Emma. Emma, you have said that from a very young age, you were interested in medicine and that you always knew that you wanted to help people. But you've also said that you never imagined yourself working in cancer biology or ovarian cancer research. And that's a surprising statement coming from someone who has already achieved so much in the ovarian cancer research field. Can you tell us more about you and how exactly did you come to work in ovarian cancer research and where do you work? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Donna. So I'm a PhD student at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute in the Sang and Berger Labs, um, but I grew up in Kitchener, Waterloo and moved to Ottawa in 2016 to start my undergraduate degree in biomedical science. I had planned throughout my undergrad to pursue medicine as a career, um, but having had some job experiences in research, I decided to apply to a master's program before possibly later continuing into medicine. And obviously I'm really enjoying uh, what I'm doing since I just signed on for a whole PhD program. Um, I always knew that I was really interested in reproductive biology and more specifically in female reproductive biology. Um, and I expected that this would lead me into a career in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, but as I was looking into researchers within the field of reproductive biology, I stumbled across my current supervisor's profile and read for the first time about the challenges of treating ovarian cancer because of chemo resistance. I'd probably never heard about ovarian cancer, let alone the need to understand treatment resistance and to develop new, or new therapeutic options. Um, that really touched me. And when I applied to my current lab, my, super, my supervisor and I immediately clicked um, along with the other, uh, my other lab colleagues. 
at this point, the rest is history. But to your point, I would never have foreseen myself as a cancer biologist, um, even going into my final year of undergrad. Uh, but now I really wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you, Emma. And it struck me rather that you had never heard of ovarian cancer. I'd never heard of ovarian cancer either until I was diagnosed with it. So thank you for the significant contributions that you've already made in research. And we'll hear more about your work later on in this session. So my question is for Dahlia. So we understand that you became interested in cancer at a very young age. When you spent time at a children's hospital volunteering in the pediatric oncology unit, you then went to attend the Canadian Conference on Ovarian Cancer Research and had the chance to meet ovarian cancer patients for the first time. Can you tell us how these experiences impacted you and how you came to work with Dr. Barbara Vander Heiden? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alicia. So I developed a liking for science at a young age. I was also always fascinated by biology, how the bo human body functioned. And I wanted to take that passion and find a career where I felt like I could make a positive impact. And so I became interested in the thought of pediatrics, so being a children's doctor. I decided to start volunteering at the Children's Hospital here in Ottawa when I was 16 on the oncology unit. And I truly value the chances I've had to spend time with these patients and families for the last six years. From this experience though, a key realization I had was how much research was still required for improving cancer treatments. And I decided I wanted to make a contribution to medicine through research. At this point, similarly to Emma, I honestly had no idea about ovarian cancer. I hadn't had much exposure to cancer biology because it's not touched on much in high school, but I decided to give it a shot. I reached out to many scientists to see if they would take me on as a student. And Dr. Barbara Vanderheiden gave me the amazing opportunity to contribute to ovarian cancer research. Through this, I had the chance to attend the Canadian Conference on Ovarian Cancer Research, and it was the session where trainees had lunch with ovarian cancer patient partners that was tru truly inspirational. I began to understand how important research is for providing patients and their families with hope, hope for a future where we can have improved outcomes for women diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And from there, I knew that this was the field I wanted to continue my research career in, and Dr. Barbara Vanderheiden has allowed me to continue following that passion. So I'm currently a first year master's student in her lab, and I hope to continue to be part of the large community trying to improve treatment outcomes. Thank you, Dahlia. So I can really relate to your comments on how interacting with people with lived experience with ovarian cancer can have a huge impact as a former trainee myself. Um, in fact, I say this all the time that interacting with patients early on in my training ultimately shaped my career path. Um, and I now have the honor of witnessing the flip side, i.e. how these same interactions have a lasting impact on patients. Morgan, you have shared that when you were a young girl, your 12 year old friend was diagnosed with leukemia. And I imagine as a child, you were greatly impacted when you watched your friend and her family go through the ordeal of cancer. And I also understand that as a young adult, you as well attended the Canadian Conference on Ovarian Cancer Research. Can you tell us please how meeting ovarian cancer patients at the conference has influenced your career path? And how exactly did you come to work in a lab with Dr. Jeanette Boudreau? Yeah, so thank you for the question, Donna. Um, so as Donna said, I'm Morgan and I'm a second year master's student at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, and I'm currently in the process of transferring to my PhD. Uh, so as you mentioned, I was exposed to cancer at a very young age when my childhood best friend was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, I watched her go through what to me seemed completely unthinkable for a 12 year old. And for over a year, this went on, and I saw the immense toll it took not only on her, but on her family as well. Uh, thankfully, she went into remission and she has remained cancer free to this day. Uh, but having watched someone go through this experience definitely motivated me to pursue cancer research. I was notably very inspired by her oncologist at the time, who was a clinician scientist, and they did a really, really great job of engaging my friend and her family and her close friends in the research he was conducting at the time on her disease. 
Uh, I distinctly remember once him taking us down to a tour of his lab where he showed me my friend's cancer shells on a microscope and he had put a smiley face on her healthy cells and a sad face on her cancer cells. And it was basically from that moment on, I always knew I had an interest in research. Uh, so when I finally made it to my undergrad here at Dell, I was really motivated to begin working in cancer research. And after taking an immunology course taught by Dr. Jeanette Boudreau, I became very interested in working on cancer immunotherapy. And I was very fortunate to find a position in her lab where I now study ovarian cancer and I've been here for about four years now. Uh, so very early in my cancer research career, I was also very fortunate to attend the Canadian Conference on Ovarian Cancer Research, where I not only had the opportunity to give a talk on my research, but I also had many opportunities to interact with the wonderful patient partners that are a part of Ovarian Cancer Canada. I think having this opportunity to discuss their experiences as patients has really put into perspective the work I'm doing, and it truly motivates me to work towards finding new treatment strategies for these patients. Thank you, Morgan. I love that story. Well today. So, Emma, uh, your research has involved looking at a protein in the blood to learn whether it could be used to detect cancer at an earlier stage than CA125, or if it may be able to predict response to chemotherapy. What has the, what was the outcome of your research and moving forward, how could the results of your study be used by other scientists? Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, what you just described was my master's project um, and I learned so much during this process. Um, so like you said, we were measuring a protein called gelsilin, which is found in the blood of pretty much everybody. Um, but we know from our work um, in the context of ovarian cancer, that this protein in ovarian cancer cells is contributing to chemo resistance. Um, but we wanted to find out if its levels in the blood, more specifically than in the tumor, would tell us any more information about an individual's cancer. So thanks to many women agreeing to donate their blood samples to research over a number of years, we were able to measure this protein in the blood of around 100 ovarian cancer patients. And we found that while it doesn't seem to be associated with earlier stage disease like we had maybe hoped, um, it was highly associated with resistance to chemotherapy. And what I think is really interesting about this research um, is that these blood samples were collected before any of these women had undergone any kinds of treatment, which means that Jocelyn could possibly be a biomarker to inform oncologists of whether an individual patient will or won't respond to chemo before they're actually given the treatment. And Donna, I know that based on conversations that we've had, uh, we've talked about how important this could be just from the perspective that chemotherapy is so hard on the body and having a way to identify ahead of time if an individual's response uh, will be worth the course of treatment could be so beneficial. Um, so this is just an early study, but I'm really hoping that these findings will be further validated and could possibly be translated into a clinical setting. Amazing. I'd also like our audience to know that your study, Emma, was published earlier this year in the Journal of Ovarian Research. So big congratulations to you. And what a different world it would be for so many patients if your predictive biomarker could help to guide physicians in prescribing treatments and, of course, ultimately result in improving patient outcomes and reducing a lot of unnecessary suffering. Thank you. Dahlia, you are currently studying the ovarian cancer tumor microenvironment in, a, in, a, in an attempt to understand how quickly a cancer will grow or metastasize, and also whether or not it will respond to chemotherapy. Can you tell us please a little more about your study? And can you also explain how our own immune cells play a role in helping cancer to grow? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Donna, for the question. Uh, so my project focuses on looking at this protein called transglutaminase 2. It has been shown that in ovarian cancer, there tends to be higher levels of this protein in the tumor and in some other cell types. What I'm doing is looking to see if this protein is involved in making an immune cell called macrophages more immune suppressive. 
This means seeing if this protein promotes the macrophages to release certain molecules that can signal to other key players in the immune system to stop killing the cancer cells. If we find that this is the case, then we plan on testing small drugs that can block the function of this protein to see if it could offer any therapeutic benefit, whether that be promoting killing of cancer cells or increasing the ability of these cancer cells to respond to other treatments such as chemotherapy. In general, there are several ways our immune system can play a role in helping cancer grow. For example, our immune system is programmed to recognize special targets on the surface of different cells. If the immune cells come across a target that it does not recognize, for example, a target on a tumor cell, then it knows to kill that specific cell. However, in the case of many cancers, the cancer cells are able to alter the targets on their surface, which makes it tricky for our immune system to recognize that the cancer cells do not belong there. In other cases, immune cells can attach to special proteins on cancer cells, which tells the immune cell to become inactivated and therefore allows the cancer cell to survive. This is why there's a tremendous amount of work being done to find treatments and ways to alter the immune system to make it better at fighting cancer. Your work just sounds incredible, Jalia. Thank you. And um, we would all dream to imagine um, a world where chemotherapy is only given to patients when we know for certain that it would eradicate their disease. This would represent huge scientific progress. So thank you for your work. So my question's for Morgan. Um, you're focused on high-grade serous ovarian cancer, a disease that is aggressive and affects 70% of all epithelial ovarian cancer patients. So as Dr. Boudreau mentioned, immunotherapy treatments have shown to be greatly effective for many different types of cancers, but unfortunately not ovarian cancer. And you are attempting to learn why. Can you explain more about your work in establishing model systems and how you're using your model system to answer important questions on immunotherapy? Yes, so thank you for your question. Um, so yeah, my work focuses on high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma or HGSC. Um, and as Jeanette mentioned earlier, for many cancers, immunotherapy has been a success story, uh, but for some reason, it still has not yet worked for ovarian cancers. Uh, so in my research, we are both trying to understand why immunotherapy hasn't worked yet, and then also explore different types of immunotherapies that may work better for certain patients, basically based upon what their tumor looks like. So for us, this means looking at factors such as the mutations that patients have, but also how their tumors progress following other treatments. Our lab believes that for HGSC, we have not yet targeted the right type of immune cell. Many existing immunotherapies, which you heard about earlier, often target a type of immune cell called T cells. But our lab believes that we should try to target a different type of immune cells called natural killer immune cells. So we are exploring that now. The other part of my project is developing a model system, which we have named T-Slice, which we all heard about earlier. Uh, and this model gives us a way to study the ovarian cancer tumors, but in a way that more accurately represents a patient. Uh, so there are many other models to study cancer that exist, but they don't always represent each patient as they kind of take a one-size-fits-all approach, if you will. Uh, so to help with this problem, we have developed T-Slice, which can be easily customized to represent different patients, and it allows us to rapidly screen new treatment options. Uh, some existing model systems are quite complex and also require specialized training to be able to use them, which means they can't always become a useful tool for all researchers to use. So our model system, T-Slice, is really simple and it's easily customizable, which makes it accessible to all research labs to adapt to their own studies. So I will be using our my T-slice model to evaluate a natural killer cell immune cell type immunotherapy in combination with other treatments with the hope of identifying specific combinations of treatments that work best for different patients. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, it's incredible to think that maybe one day we could harness our own immune cells um, and immune systems to kill ovarian cancer cells instead of, again, instead of relying on toxic chemotherapy drugs. Um, and we're very excited to watch as your research progresses. Emma, in addition to cancer research, you've shared that you're also passionate about working directly with patients. And that's something that people who are working in a research lab rarely get to do. You are committed 
to patient engagement, and you also believe that every research trainee could benefit from working with patients. Can you tell us, please, a little more about how implementing patient engagement has influenced and supported your research, and how has working with patients affected you personally? Absolutely. So one of the first things that I noticed when I started my research in the lab was that it can be really hard to visualize the line between our research and the patients in the clinic. We understand that this research is very important. We know all the statistics about the disease. We understand ovarian cancer at a molecular level, but most of us don't necessarily have that human connection to what ovarian cancer is and its impact. Early on, I felt that my research was a bit abstract and up in the air. Around the same time, I learned about the push towards ovarian cancer, or sorry, the push towards patient engagement and research, uh, where patients are directly incorporated into research teams and help to guide research directions, interpret research outcomes, um, and share findings, among other things. And I immediately immediately understood um, the value, but recognized that as laboratory scientists, most of us don't have any experience in talking to patients in our respective fields. So I received a small research grant to explore the how-to of patient engagement in a laboratory setting, which has led me uh, to the opportunity to work with several of the patient partners in research uh, from OCC and I'm hoping to continue to do so throughout the duration of my PhD program. I think that implementing patient engagement and research has really given me the opportunity to hear perspectives that I never would have considered otherwise, especially as a person with no immediate or personal experience with ovarian cancer. And I find that engaging with patients has affected me personally in grounding my research and providing me with a lot of motivation to continue through the challenges of research. Uh, one thing that has re resonated with me over the last year of working with you, Donna, is you saying that as ovarian cancer patients, it's all about hope. Um, and I hope that um, we can both offer each other mutual hope and support, and that's a massive win. For sure. Thank you, Emma. You, you said one day one of my, I think was become my all-time favorite quote, and that is that hope works both ways. So thanks for what you are providing to us. So Dahlia, so in addition to your work in the research lab, you also believe that advocating for ovarian cancer is important. You're passionate about youth outreach, uh, such as educating high school students about cancer through Let's Talk Cancer events, the very ones that Julie Pauling was talking about in the PPIR session. This sounds like a fantastic initiative. Um, can you please tell us more about this recent event? Yeah, absolutely. So Let's Talk Science is an organization whose goal is to provide science-based programs to youth. Here in Ottawa, as part of Let's Talk Science, we have a cancer outreach group. Um, and there are about six of us on the organizing committee. Emma is also part of our group and an additional 20 volunteers. So our goal is to bring cancer-related activities to classrooms to expose youth to the field of cancer biology with the hopes of inspiring them to pursue a career in STEM and hopefully cancer research down the line. Recently, we hosted 160 students at our Faculty of Medicine Research Building in Ottawa um, for our Let's Talk Cancer event, where students got to learn more about cancer biology, do hands-on activities, network with students and professionals who are in the field of cancer biology, they got to hear from Dr. Barbara Vanderheiden and her journey to becoming a cancer scientist, and then a very inspirational talk from one of OCC's patient partners, Julie Pauling, who you heard from earlier this evening. What's great about this event was having the opportunity to introduce students to cancer biology and research as it's not touched on very much in high school. And we hope that from these outreach events, we can inspire youth to consider careers in science and hopefully further down the line, a career in cancer research because these students are the future of scientific progress. Sorry, <laughs> technical <laughs> difficulties. So the fact that 160 high school students were able to hear from you guys, leading researchers, trainees, and those with lived experience is incredible. Um, so early in, in their schooling. So I'm sure you inspired many in the audience to consider re research as a future career path. 
Yeah, that sounds like it was just such an amazing uh, event, 160 students, wow. Um, Morgan, um, you also strongly believe in advocating for our disease. And recently you were able to showcase your research to the federal government during a lab tour in Halifax. And what was that like for you to have a chance to speak directly to someone in that position about your work and its potential impact? And did you ever think that you'd be involved in something like this? Uh, so to begin with your last question, uh, no, I never thought I would have the opportunity to be involved with something like this, especially as a trainee. Um, but having had that lived experience of watching someone go through cancer treatment and also recognizing the desperate need for new treatments for ovarian cancers like HGSC, it was truly amazing to have this experience and share our work. Uh, so just to provide a little bit of context, uh, earlier this year, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to speak to the to two government officials, uh, namely the Honorable Francois Philippe Champagne, the Minister of Science and Innovation, as well as Andy Fillmore, a fellow member of Parliament. Uh, so as politicians, they have the ability to influence change and promote initiatives such as those being taken by Ovarian Cancer Canada. However, they don't always spend their day to day engrossed in the science as we researchers do. So to be able to put them in our shoes for the day, uh, bring them into our world and show them how important ovarian cancer research really is, and also showcase some of the groundbreaking work we're doing was a really, really unique and empowering experience to have as a trainee. Uh, often as researchers, we exist in the background until our findings translate to the clinical side, as it feels like. Um, so to be able to shine the light on the research not only happening in our lab, but in other labs across Canada, I feel like we've truly put Ovarian Cancer Canada's research efforts in the spotlight. Thank you so much, Morgan. And I was privileged to be able to attend that lab tour in person. Um, and I can attest to how effective you were at inspiring those in attendance at the lab tour at all levels. Um, and I can't overstate the importance um, and the importance that we put into continuing our momentum in advocating for government funding for ovarian cancer research. So thank you. Okay, and so to finish up everyone, we just have one rapid fire question, same question for each of you. And the question is, as patients, how can we best support you and your work? How can we help you? We'll start with you, Emma. Yeah, I think really, as I hope that I've conveyed up to this point, um, personally, I'm really motivated by your hope and your you know interest in our work um and i hope that you know being able to see and hear about what we do you know continues to provide inspiration um and you know getting to work with you has been really just a tremendous experience so i think just being able to you know work with you in our own work offers plenty of benefit thanks emma and morgan how about you uh, so from my perspective, I feel like the best way is really just to keep engaging and keep the conversation going. Um, we all just value patient input so much as it really truly helps us to put into perspective the work we're doing. And it also helps us to make sure we're asking the right questions and taking all the right considerations in our own research. So I encourage any of you to reach out, start a conversation and offer some input if you're interested as it really can truly enhance the impact that our work has. Great, and Dahlia? I'm very much going to echo um, what Emma and Morgan said, but I would say commuting, communicating and engaging with us. As researchers, we try our best to gear our projects towards what we think would help improve treatment options and diagnosis, but this doesn't necessarily reflect what's valuable to you. By engaging with us, we can ensure we conduct research that's valuable and most relevant to patient and loved ones affected by ovarian cancer. Thank you. So thank you so much to all of you. We do have a tiny bit of time for a few audience questions. Um, I'm actually going to take something that was a comment in the chat and kind of turn it turn it on its head as a question, um, and any of you can answer. So what I want to know is if you think that patient engagement should be a requirement for any grad student studying ovarian cancer research. I can start to, by answering that one. Um, 
as I've personally had experience so far in engaging with patient partners in my graduate studies, I think this has really shaped the way that I view my research and the motivation that I continue to get to continue. We all know very well that you know research is really grueling and can be quite challenging. Um, and so having these interactions is so beneficial. So right now there's maybe a bit of a lack of infrastructure to make that happen um, from the university perspective. But I think that if you know that can be prioritized in the future, that that would be so beneficial to all of us. Anyone else, Dahlia? So, I would also say like even beyond PhD studies, um, kind of extending that to almost every person who's working in the lab, every project, um, it would be so beneficial even as a master's student right now for our research associates or postdocs. Um, it really offers us a, a different perspective that we may not have thought of initially. Um, so I do think it definitely should be implemented, but as Emma said, I think there would just have to be a bit more infrastructure um, in order to make that happen. Morgan, would you like to add to that? Not to call on you. No, that's okay. Uh, I think I'm just mostly going to echo exactly what they both have just said. I think if we did have the infrastructure for it and the ability for it to be integrated into our programs, I think it could be very, very impactful. Um, so just to make our research a little bit more, I guess, put it into real life or put it into perspective, like truly show the impact that our work um, could do, kind of help us ask the right questions, um, be a little bit more informed about what we're investigating. I think there truly could be some benefit there for sure. Great. And there are some comments that are along those lines uh, in the chat um, in terms of this should really be a condition of grant funding to include patient partners, as well as um, someone saying you have a cohort of committed patients ready to call on. So I don't think you'll have an issue with getting patients um, to, to work with you. Um, there was one question about your work, Emma. Um, it was about, oops, one moment. This is why it's hard to do both at the same time. <laughs> so the question is, so when someone has reacted well to chemo once and then becomes resistant, does that mean that the protein you study is higher in the blood at that point? Um, do treatments that help become less resistant to chemo also affect this protein? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and so in our study, we were focused on samples from patients that had not yet undergone any treatment. So this would have been before any surgery, before any chemotherapy. This would have been blood collected really at the time of diagnosis. Um, and so what that would tell us is what we're hoping anyways is that that's telling us that a patient will or won't respond to chemo before any chemo is given. Um, but we do get the question a lot about whether this, tell, do we know if this tells us anything about after a patient has undergone chemotherapy for in a recurrent setting? Um, and that's a question that we haven't answered yet, um, but is something that we've definitely thought about, um, as well as understanding what the, how this protein might relate to resistance to other types of treatments. Um, but yeah, so we've, we've started to answer one question, but, um, in research, we always find ourselves with more questions than we started with. So these are definitely, um, avenues of future research. Perfect. And someone also commented or asked, does OCC currently have, or could we build partnerships with universities to make the, um, patient engagement for grad students happen? And I think that's a great idea, um, that we should explore. So before I throw it over to Donna for final thoughts, um, I just wanna read one more comment um, that happens to be from Kaylee Crawford, but I just think it's such a great comment is that I just brought my 11 year old daughter to come in to see you all speak. I wanted her to see such brilliant women share about the research with such passion. So thank you all. I just thought that perfectly summed up the, the vibe in the comment section right there. Does it ever? And I was going to use the word brilliant as well. I hope that everyone in the audience today has been as inspired as I am by these three brilliant young women. And thank you so much for your work. And so to all of our listeners today, um, please do consider supporting research 
at any opportunity in any way that you can, because only science can save us. And we have uh, just put the slide back up on the screen. If you're interested in joining the Patient Partners in Research team, um, once again, you can contact uh, Jessica Lawson and we'll put her email in the chat as well. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, Donna, Alicia, Dahlia, Emma, and Morgan. Um, I'm really pulling a theme here and I love that. It's the theme of collabor collaboration and teamwork and interacting with the patients at an earlier stage. I also pulled a comment uh, from the chat box and it was from our CEO, Tanya Briones. And she says, I'm continually blown away by the brilliant minds that are dedicating their careers to ovarian cancer research. And I just couldn't agree more. And again, just want to thank you all so much for being here tonight and sharing with us your journey to becoming a trainee in ovarian cancer and your passion for your work. I am now excited to introduce you to our next speakers who are investigating new research models of low-grade serous ovarian cancer by using patient tissue samples. Joining us this evening are Dr. Mark Carey, a gynecologic oncologist at Vancouver General Hospital. His primary areas of clinical and academic interest are the management and study of rare gynecological cancers, preclinical drug evaluation, and predictive biomarker discovery and application. And working with Dr. Carey and joining us for the presentation this evening are Dr. Dr. Marta Laredo Fernandez, Dr. Nelson Wong, and Hannah Kim. So within Dr. Carey's lab, Dr. Laredo Fernandez is the research associate and program manager, and Dr. Nelson Wong is the staff scientist. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Carey. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks very much for having us. We really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the uh, part of the meeting today. And um, yeah, we've, we've really heard from um, some excellent uh, researchers already. So, and uh, and it's been nice to see how they've really highlighted the need to the need to do patient oriented research. We're really fortunate to be. Um, part of this journey for patients and individuals affected by low-grade serous cancers. And so we'd like to share some of that with you today, some of the work that we've been doing. And we really appreciate also the support we've received from Ovarian Cancer Canada. So it's, it's great to be here. There's a couple of other members of the lab, Maddie, who's here, who's been our master student, and Yun Yi, um, who's, who's now one of our technicians who joined us as well. So nice, nice to be here. Yeah, there they are there. So we're going to talk a little bit about the work we're doing. Can I control the slides here? Is that, yeah, great. Yeah, so this is uh, this is our lab and um, it, it's been a great experience. We've been working at this over the last uh, 10 years, I would say, um, trying to advance uh, and improve treatment for patients and individuals affected by low-grade serous cancers. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And this is a group we've already, you'll, you'll meet some of them uh, directly. So to introduce you. So for ovarian cancers, um, one of the transformations that we've made, and this is how we identified in part that low-grade serous cancers are a distinct type of cancer. So we recognize in ovarian cancer, there's many different types of cancer. We used to we used to characterize them just based upon the, um, the what what the cancers look like by light microscopy. I don't know if this works here. The pointer, yeah. So these are the light microscopy. So a pathologist would look at the slides and just tell by light microscopy sections under the microscope what type of cancer it is. But now we appreciate that even in within each type of these cancers there's distinguishing molecular features that characterize them. And some of them are, are more similar as different types of traditional cancers than they are different. So we now not only appreciate the, the what these cancers look like under the microscope, but these unique molecular features that characterize the cancers. And now we can use these to determine um, different treatment strategies. So in low-grade serous cancers, um, this is the group, they tend to occur in younger women. And then there's a spectrum of different mutations that we see in, in these cancers that distinguish them from some of the others. So 
So we've been really fortunate that um, uh, we've been assisted, our work's been assisted by uh, many patient advocates and families of, of individuals affected with low-grade serous cancers. And they really helped get our program started and Ovarian Cancer Canada and, and all the um, work that they are now doing on the research on research for ovarian cancers really, really helped us do a lot of this work. And so I just want to recognize some of the patient advocates that, that have helped us. And I'll talk a little bit about, about them later, um, more specifically. And um, when it comes to, we've, we've already heard a little bit about, sorry. Um, oh, okay. Sorry about that. We've already heard a little bit about um, the, the need to understand or ask the best questions um, what, as we understand the, the patient experience. And so um, in low-grade serious cancer, um, patients have really um, told us about how important it is to have equity in their cancer care. They have fewer treatment options than, than most the more common types of ovarian cancers. Um, there's, there's um, less research that's been done. There's less research funding. And so we've, we've worked hard to try and correct some of those inequities. And um, patients have clearly um, uh, communicated to us how important it is for, for them to have more treatment options and more effective treatments for their cancer. So these are the learning objectives of things that we were, were asked to address today, but we want to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that we've done in the rare gynecologic cancer database and low-grade cancer specifically. We got this started. Um, we're, March is going to talk about um, some of the laboratory models and, and the, um, the types of research models that we've been working on that help facilitate research. And then we'll give you a few examples of some of the patient-partnered research that we've been working on. Now, Hannah's going to talk a little bit about the database as she's uh, really done a lot of work on this. Um, and, and we're pleased to see that we're able to operationalize some of this work now um, for some of the other research um, uh, projects that we're working on. So, Hannah. Hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I've been involved in creating multiple red cap databases uh, for rare gynecologic cancers. So, we've had success with our retrospective low grade database which sparked interest in six Canadian provinces, resulting in the creation of a multi-center data sharing agreement, uh, which includes five major cancer uh, referral centers. So most of the database work was unfunded, but with um, the help of Ovarian Cancer Canada, we have now submitted to the Strategic Science Fund to support this. So the main goals of the RARE database uh, is to report on patient outcomes, link patients to clinical trials and research initiatives, as well as annotate models for um, Perry Fox Research Institute. So the recent white paper submitted by the Ovarian Cancer Canada, um, we were successful in securing $1.5 million to sequence rare gynecological cancers across four provinces. So by sequencing these rare cancers, we can understand the biology of these cancers um, so with our database, we can then link these molecularly characterized cancers to the clinical features, such as treatment information and outcomes. We can better understand the disease and look for a better treatment for the disease. And Mara will now show you what we've been doing. Yeah, Mara is gonna talk a little bit about the model development now. Thanks, Hannah. So hi everyone, and um, very, Pleased to be joining this session today and very impressed with every other speaker and participant and all the patient experiences. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to focus on explaining a little bit more the uh, patient derived research models, specifically the ones that we have developed for low rate ovarian cancers. Um, and this is mainly funded by the, um, over, the Ovarian Cancer Canada uh, Often One initiative. Now, our laboratory has been um, funded through the different research priority competitions, and, and we're going to be focusing on the often one and often two for this time. So um, all these patient-derived research models can be used in different ways. There are 
three main ways. One is the cancer biology, studying better the tumors and how they evolve, appear, and, and progress. Also to, to, to use them as um, tools for drug testing and prediction of drug efficacy, as well as to accelerate research by sharing them with other laboratories across the world. So um, our lab mainly has been using tumor samples or ascites from low-grade serious ovarian cancer patients that consented to research. And we have been even growing them in, in laboratory um, petri dishes, so, uh, some type of plates where we see the tumor cells and we expand them over time. And we also try to implant tissues on mice and try to develop models that we can keep using in the lab for um, molecular studies as well as uh, drug testing and drug efficacy prediction. So we to, to date we have been developing the we have developed the largest collection of low grade serious ovarian cancer patient uh, patient drive models. Um, this includes like more than twenty different cell lines, cell cultures that they look like this. Different like these are the the tumor cells growing in petri dishes as you can see here. And we have also developed nine different patient derived mice models where we keep propagating the tumor from the patient and trying different drug treatments. Um, some of, uh, of the uses of these models, as we mentioned, is for drug testing and drug prediction. So in collaboration with a group in the Netherlands, we have been using some of the um, patient derived cell line models and mice models to test a, a novel drug combination that seems to be working in a subset of loaded patients or loaded models. And, and we have been trying to identify what it could be um, associated with drug efficacy um, by looking into biomarkers that distinguish cells that are sensitive and resistant to some of these treatments. And this was published um, last year. Another um, use of the patient-derived models can be not only to test existing drugs, but to discover new treatments. And this work, one, one of the works we have done was uh, in low-grade studios, um, was um, in partnership with uh, Josie Smith, a patient partner in research. Um, so a patient as, as well as a, a physician. Um, and Dr. Martin Cobble, a pathologist in Calgary, with some people from our team. We basically use the loaded serious ovarian cancer patient derived uh, research, uh, sorry, cell line models mm -hmm. to investigate what was in the surface of these cells to identify other ways to target them and deliver existing drugs or new drugs. So by doing that, we identify folate receptor one or folate receptor alpha that seems to be express highly expressed in some of the loaded tissues, not in some others, and definitely not in some of the normal tissues. So it allows us to target a group of patients um, with a more accurate um, drug delivery method, that it's using antibodies linked to a drug that can target these surface markers and deliver the drug to the right cells and not the normal cells. So it's a more direct anti-cancer treatment approach. Now, the this is a drug that's called mirbetoximab. Again, it's an antibody linked to a drug. Um, and that has been already tested in some high-grade serious ovarian cancer patients with some promising results. Again, these treatments seem to be working as a set of patients. But uh, we have, through this uh, first clinical trial, um, researchers or uh, physicians I identified the, the, the patients that seem to be more um, able to benefit from these, these treatments are actually the, the ones that have the highest levels of expression of the receptor. This seems to be the case for about 40% of the low-risk serious ovarian cancer tumors we have analyzed so far. So now there is a new coming clinical trial that it will include low-risk patients with this new drug. So we're hoping that um, there's going to be some good results from this uh, study. Now, uh, through the Often One initiative, we also got funded to develop a different type of model that gets in between what's a, a cell line that's just epithelial tumor cells growing in a plate and a mice model that's a tumor piece of the tumor growing and propagating into mice models. The in-between model is called a 3D cell culture or organoid. Um, and basically it allows to grow cells in a more um, tumor um, structure 
Um, so it has a is more uh, comprehensive of what a tumor uh, the complex it has the complexity of a tumor, but it allows to to test drugs um, much faster than in in mice models. So we're hoping that um, we can develop with these models to faster screen some of the drugs before we go to mice or even patients. Um, so again, another of the uses of the patient-derived research models is accelerating progress and creating larger impact. And we have been able to do that and through sharing our models with the international community. Like our research was mainly funded from, um, started to be funded by a single family, the McKenzie family. And now we have been able to, with the help of Brain Cancer Canada and other um, funding sources, we have been able to share it and expand the research that can be done in loaded studios. One of the examples is the loaded studios community of practice across Canada that has been established and we are able to track clinical um, data across the, the, the country. The loaded Serious Ovarian Cancer International Consortium is, is, is uh, planning to expand the database into the US as well and to do other like molecular analysis in tumor samples as well as cell lines. Then we have a couple of collaborations in UK and Australia. They are going to be doing high throughput drug screens in our cell line models and being uh, they are going to be testing over 3,000 different compounds, single and combinations to identify novel promiser treatments for validation and biomarker discovery. And now I'll pass the third to Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. And thank you for this, uh, for the opportunity that we can share uh, what we've been doing. Uh, so my name is Nelson, and uh, I'm a member of the uh, lab of Dr. Mark Carey. And in the past, uh, most of my work was related to developing patient-derived xenograph models. Um, but today I would like to share with you a very special uh, test that we were able to develop in the lab. And then this work is actually funded jointly by Ovarian Cancer Canada, as well as Cancer Research Society. Now, so um, as mentioned, uh, one of the major interests of the lab is to study and understand low-grade serous ovarian carcinoma, uh, which is a rare, rare uh, ovarian cancer. And we know that with this type of ovarian cancer, um, a lot of the, the tumors actually express a hormone receptor that is called estrogen receptor. And we have learned it from other uh, cancers uh, with hormone receptors, such as breast cancers or prostate cancers, that if you cut the uh, supply of the hormone to these cancers, um, the cancers will not grow very, very well. So in a way that is a control, a good control um, of these type of hormone um, uh, dependent cancers. But then the, the major question is, uh, we don't know who will uh, benefit from this type of uh, therapy and who would not. So, but we do want to find out the questions uh, to this question, uh, the answer to this question, because obviously we don't want to expose patients to anti-hormone therapy and its associated toxicity if the individual with the disease is not going to benefit from the therapy. Um, and of course, also, if there are um, patients that we know that would not benefit from this kind of therapy, um, then better alternatives should be sought for, for them. So that we, we uh, want to find out the, the answers to, to this question. Um, and then to this, we actually made use of a very specialized uh, model system. So this is an example of how uh, some of our model system can be used uh, for research. Um, so in this uh, very specialized model system, we receive consented patient tissue, and then we use a specialized surgical technique to put the patient tissue as shown as a white piece of tissue here um, into under the renal capsule of uh, the experimental mice. And then under this condition, the patient tumor is actually, is going to be preserved very well. And then uh, we're actually able to do a short-term uh, experiment uh, for two weeks. Basically we expose the mice under either estrogen or without estrogen. And then to see how the how the tumor would actually react under these conditions. So then, this is an example of a patient tumor. This is directly from patient tumor, actually exposed under the conditions that I've mentioned, either in the presence of estrogen or in the absence of estrogen. 
So I hope that you can see that in the presence of estrogen, the cells, the cancer cells are actually much more full and plump and they look healthy. But in the absence of estrogen, they actually so, sort of shrivel up like, uh, um, I guess, uh, raisins or grapes that shrivel up or dried raisins. So, so they don't look that healthy. And in order to help us to better visualize the difference, we perform a staining that's called KI67, as you can see with these brown dots here. Basically what it indicates is that if you have more of, the, of these brown dots, um, it indicates that there are more of these growing cancer cells. And then, and then you can see that in the absence of estrogen, in this case with this patient tumor, um, when there's no estrogen, then there is a drastic decrease of these brown dots, meaning that there's a drastic decrease of the uh, growing cells. So there's a high chance that this patient tumor would actually respond quite well to anti-hormone therapy, um, i.e. that is um, um, represented in, with the absence of estrogen in this case. But as I also mentioned, not all the low-grade patient tissue would actually respond to this kind of therapy. And this is one of the examples. So as you can see here, that's in the presence of estrogen, the cells, again, they organize into this well-structured pockets of cells, and they seem to be growing quite well. Um, but you also notice that in the absence of estrogen, it, they still look the same. And also, as I mentioned, to help us to better visualize the effect of the absence of estrogen, we also did KI67 staining. And as you can see, the amount of brown dots is actually very uh, comparable between the case when you have estrogen or when you have the case that there's no estrogen. So, so um, by performing this short-term assay, uh, we're actually able to pick out um, some of the patient tissues that uh, would have a high chance to respond well to anti-hormone therapy. And there's also, uh, we can also pick out the cases that would not respond well to anti-hormone therapy. So through studying the differences between these tumor samples and, and combining the clinical data that we can access to, uh, we, we, we trust that we can actually formulate a set of parameters that will help us to predict uh, which patient or which low-grade cancer patient will actually benefit from anti-hormone therapy and which patient will actually not benefit um, from the anti-hormone therapy. So this is uh, our, our goal uh, with this project. But I would also like to suggest that um, with, the, with the example that I've given you, um, there's a lot of implication in personalized cancer uh, treatments. And as you may know, for rare cancers, it's very difficult to find the right treatment for these patients. And some of these patients perhaps today, perhaps today is enrolled in some of the personalized anti-cancer program in larger centers, in which case they would actually um, consent to give some of their patient uh, the tumor samples. And the tumor samples would be analyzed. Um, they will go through genetic testings uh, to analyze perhaps the mutational landscape of these uh, to, uh, tumors. And then with that information, uh, several drugs would be suggested um, that potentially they may have an effect on these tumors. And then these drugs will be suggested to a tumor board of uh, clinicians and scientists. And then with the best knowledge, they will pick out uh, the drug that would probably work the best for these uh, uh, very rare kind of cancers. But what is missing is that that's um, so far, there's no good biological assessment, but with the, with the, the short-term assay that I have just described, this might actually partially provide the answer. And as you can imagine, for example, if a tumor that, is, that doesn't have known good treatment with the genetic analysis potentially would suggest three to five potential treatments. And you can imagine if we are able to subject the patient tumors directly to these three to five suggested treatments and then pick out the best. So we will be able to best uh, equip to find the, the proper treatment for, for the patients um, that would not normally have a very good uh, kind of treatment. Yeah. So, um, so this is also an example of how we can actually use some of the models that we have been developing in the lab. And so with that, then I would like to hand it over back to Dr. Carey um, to conclude our presentation.
Well, thanks very much. Um, you can see that I'm privileged to be able to work with such a fine group of individuals, and um, we're, we're pleased to be doing this work on behalf of patients and individuals with low-grade serous cancer. Um, in line with our um, with our title slide, uh, I think we've been able to show that that I mean these models that we've developed from patients who've contributed their tissues and. Um, for this type of research that, that we're doing our best to leverage that to, um, to accelerate the research that we're doing. And I think in low-grade serous cancer now, there's, there's perhaps three new treatments on the horizon, which is, which is really, really encouraging for us. And um, we just have to continue to do our work. Um, we've been privileged to witness an incredible amount of um, advocacy on the part of um, um, public fundraising groups like Ovarian Cancer Canada and patient advocates like Jane Ludeman here, who's who started the Cure Our Ovarian Cancer program and sponsors the um, sponsors the um, international consortium on low grade serous cancers and and then um, you know we've been privileged to have people like Donna and and Karen who have. Uh, helped us with our grant writing and helped us um, move some of our projects forward. And we really appreciate their input and people like Amy, whose family has also contributed to um, fundraising initiatives in low-grade serious cancer. And then um, a relative of mine, um, Janet Cottrell from Toronto, who Janet has, has contributed to our work as well. And Janet's contributed to other ovarian cancer um, programs in, in Toronto and the Sunnybrook area. And Ellie Mayday, who some of you may know, um, who's, who's a plus size model who um, really made and, and enhanced awareness in low grade serious cancers through um, her public, um, like her, her public uh, disclosure about her illness. And um, she really, she really, uh, heightened awareness of the disease and, and has really helped us focus uh, some of our fundraising efforts on improving care. So we're, we're, we've done a lot of work, but we still have a lot of work to do. And when it comes to the work uh, for the patient, we, we really want to continue to focus our efforts on finding new treatments and, and um, creating better support systems for our patients. Uh, we recognize that there's huge financial um, financial challenges for patients with cancer. And, and there's really um, many, many, um, many, many facets of work that we can do to um, help um, better treat and um, manage this disease. So uh, we're committed to doing that. And, and thanks for your attention today. I want to thank you all for that. It was wonderful to see all of you together um, and, and to hear from most of you. Uh, we just have time for one question. So um, low-grade serous can be so confusing for patients because the standard of care varies globally. Many countries treat low-grade serous with chemotherapy. Under what conditions would you recommend chemotherapy? And is there a specific therapy that has shown efficacy? And that's that's a great question. Um, I mean, there's there's right now there's a a large randomized trial that's being conducted because we we still have a lot of work to do to sort out what the optimal treatment approach is. And I think um, the answer to that's going to be that it'll be somewhat different depending on the type of low grade serous cancer one has. So. Um, yeah, the, the study is comparing chemotherapy with what we call maintenance anti-hormone therapy. So the patients get chemotherapy first, and then that's followed by maintenance anti-hormone therapy like letrozole uh, versus patients just going on letrozole. Um, and so that, that study is accruing relatively well. And I think it's I, I, I think it's going to give us more answers with respect to how best to choose patients for the right treatment. And I think that's where we're going because what we're seeing is that like hopefully with these other treatments that are going to come online soon, that there'll be specific patient populations that will benefit from treatment A. And there's some new drugs called CDK4-6 inhibitors or palvoxiclib is one example of that drug. Um, and they may be beneficial in a certain subgroup of patients versus standard chemotherapy and others. 
versus hormonal therapy or combinations? So um, I guess the answer to the question is I can't answer the question right now. We're, we're, we're um, in the midst of, of trying to better understand um, which, which treatments will benefit which group of patients and then how to best sequence those treatments for patients. I agree. Thank you. It is, it's exciting though that there is a lot on the horizon. So thank you. And I want to thank you all again for joining us tonight from Vancouver. It really was great to see uh, so many people involved in the presentation. So uh, thank you very much. Um, as, Tanya you. as Tanya mentioned earlier in the evening, uh, we take a multi-pronged approach to research to ensure that all types of ovarian cancer, even the rare forms, are prioritized to ensure that everyone benefits from the best available science as quickly as possible. And we are on to our last session of the evening. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Laura Hopkins, a gynecologic oncologist and a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. She's also the provincial lead for the gynecologic oncology department here in Saskatchewan. And Dr. Hopkins will be sharing a quick update on the patient decision aid, an aid for those who are tumor tested and found to be homologous recombination proficient. The aid was created to inform and empower patient decision making around treatment. Hello from Saskatchewan. We've got lots of great stuff happening here for patients, and I'm happy to give you a little update today. Our biggest recent news here is that our tumor testing trial is activated now, and we'll be starting to recruit patients in just a couple of weeks. This tumor testing trial is called a pragmatic trial, and it is the first pragmatic trial in ovarian cancer in Canada. And what's a pragmatic trial, you might ask? Well, these are also called real-world evidence trials, and that means trials that enroll patients of a more everyday type. Conventional clinical trials that you may be more familiar with have a long list of inclusion and exclusion criteria so that there's sort of a cherry-picking that's going on right from the start. Real-world evidence trials are a come-as-you-are kind of trial designed to enroll everyone and be as inclusive as possible. We're going to implement tumor testing for HRD. And with those results, we can be very precise with patients as to how much benefit they can obtain from taking a PARP inhibitor for maintenance therapy. Right now, we cannot have that conversation because tumor testing is not a standard of care. We simply have a blanket approval to treat with a PARP inhibitor for anyone who shows response to initial treatment. And within that group, there's a broad range of response that's possible. Some fantastic, some great, and some not so great. We're doing the trial because this kind of information matters in terms of patients' decisions and the kind of quality of life that they want to enjoy at a time when they are otherwise asymptomatic and enjoying remission. So we're going to do the tumor testing and we're going to provide those results to patients as per the, the trial protocol at the end of their initial treatment. So when the chemotherapy and surgery is done for patients who are HRD, and that includes BRCA mutations, the patients will be recommended to strongly to take a PARP inhibitor. Olaparib is approved for BRCA scenario, and niraparib is approved for HRD patients. This means that they have another genetic change present that acts like BRCA. The entire collective group is referred to as the deficient group. For the rest of patients, we call them HRP, and the P means proficient. Proficient patients do not respond well or reliably to PARP inhibitors. The benefit in terms of the amount of time that relapse is delayed is about the same as the amount of time patients would spend experiencing sometimes very serious side effects of the PARP inhibitor. In this situation, doctors are uncertain of how to advise patients, and so patients need to decide and be the real decision maker as to whether or not the drug is right for them based on their own personal priorities and preferences. So in order to help patients with that, we created a patient decision aid, and it's for the proficient group. It's a resource that's written in plain language and lays out the benefits versus all the various side effects. 
We put together an incredible team of patients, researchers, and experts in patient decision aid methods to create this resource. We worked on it for almost a year. It meets criteria for quality in terms of the international patient decision aid standards, and it's been tested by other gynae oncologists and patients with ovarian cancer in Canada. We received a number of excellent suggestions and we refined the document and it's now ready for prime time evaluation as part of our trial. We will be measuring the value of the tumor testing information to patients and looking closely at quality of life in terms of PARP inhibitor toxicities and the real world benefit in terms of delaying relapse. We hope to use the results of this study to make tumor testing a reality and a standard of care for everyone. You may now be sitting there thinking about moving to Saskatchewan, and that would be cool. But I want to reassure you uh, and just say that we've been having conversations with other gynae oncology groups across the country so that we can offer this tumor testing to other patients from provinces that aren't including Saskatchewan. We have the interest of many other sites at this time, and certainly the Prairie provinces are all in and we'll be working to see what possibilities exist to take this national. Finally, this trial has brought scientists into the circle of care in a very tangible way. We had a big meeting in early May with scientists and ovarian cancer researchers from Manitoba, Alberta, BC, and Saskatchewan, and we're making strategic plans now to use all of the expertise we have to focus on new therapeutics, new targets, new predictive biomarkers that may even allow us to diagnose high-grade serous ovarian cancer early and before it has had a chance to spread. I hope you're now as excited as we are. The science is really close now to care, and we're going to close the gap. We're in the sweet spot. So thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you so much, Dr. Hopkins, for sharing that with us. And I'll say again, it's about collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Um, we will be super excited to follow along with this and hear further updates as the trial progresses. And with that, uh, we will conclude the formal part of our evening tonight. So I'm just going to take one more 